my name is Fred Pike, and I'm going to do some talking. You know, it's not often you get to perform these days in front of a captive audience. So I thought I'd take advantage of that and uh, subject you to my wonderful singing voice and my even better guitar skills. So as you probably heard from the song, my name is Fred Pike and I'm here in Milwaukee and wish I was in Hungary, but not. I think we've got a really fun three hour section coming up here. And I've got to tell you when, when I first got the contact from um, Zolly about Super Week TV, he said, um, so, you know, who wants to be uh, who wants to be a host for a while? And I said, yeah, sure, whatever, I'll, I'll do that. So he signed me up and later on I found out, oh, there's gonna be sections with friends. And I'm thinking, holy cow, friends, I don't have any friends. But I, I kind of dragged through my list of contacts and I was able to find a few that were willing to be on screen with me. The first one today is going to be Eric Driesen from the Netherlands, who is a Golden Punch Card winner a while, two years ago, I think. Um, then I also will have Anna Lewis and Ahmad Kanani joining me. We're going to have um, Julius Federovicius, and I, I know I didn't pronounce his name right. Julius Fed, as he goes, and John McGowan or Johnny Wandering join us. We're going to be talking about travel and, and maybe a bit of GA4. Also, I know that uh, Zali said we'd love to have some recorded sessions. So I said, well, I can, I can think of two. I could either do a banana bread one, because I've been doing that every week during the pandemic, or I could do one on GA4 events. And um, Zali wrote back and said, huh, I want to be like a greedy regex. I want both. Can you do both? So I said, sure, what the heck, I'd be happy to do both. So, so far, this has been a pretty exciting experience, I think. Um, we've had some really great sessions. I never, I never attended when Avinash was coming to Super Week. I think my first Super Week was 2018. And to watch him speak and to watch his presentation was just so cool. I mean, that whole focus on the business as opposed to the business of analytics, that, that is just awesome. And it's something that... I, for one, probably don't do enough of, and I bet you that's that's pretty typical too. Also, I was a ski instructor for years and years, and um, I think the the segment with Matsya uh, skiing in the Swiss Alps. Oh my God, that was so cool! I can I can hardly wait until I can actually go to the Swiss Alps and do that too. So we have, let's see. What, oh, and of course, Simo. Simo was, was really good with the server side tagging. I mean, everything's been good. And I, one thing that I love about people who come to Super Week is that we're all kind of frustrated musicians too. I mean, there have been jam sessions at, at night um, at the ones I was at. I saw a guitar behind Maria. Yehoshua joined, or leads us in singing, of course. I, I think there were four different ukuleles or ukuleles behind Simo. So I figured I had to bring out my guitar and, and do something. Uh, so what else do we have today? Um, oh my God, the spaghetti carbonara. Oh, what, that was phenomenal. And, and you're gonna see my kitchen with the banana bread recipe and compared to, to the, the kitchen that um, Roberto and Mateo had, <laughs> I'm almost ashamed to do that. So just pretend that my kitchen is a is a backdrop, kind of like like this one, and the one that and my real kitchen is is even better than Mateo and and Roberto's. So we'll we'll see what happens there. So I think the what's going to come up shortly is uh, Miroslav Varga talking about the analytics grandfather approach, and then. Um, and then my good friend, Eric, is gonna join me live. Now it's kind of funny. So I met Eric at the first Super Week I went to. 
which was 2018, and it was his first Super Week also. And I'm one of the people who sit in front. I love to sit in front. And Eric is uh, is that type of person too. So we we bonded fairly quickly over sitting in front and being able to steal the water bottles from the speaker table. So that's uh, something I don't think we're supposed to do, but we did end up doing that. Then the, the second year, we both competed in the golden punch card. And he asked me, so what is yours about? And I said, oh, I'm using the Google NLP, the Natural Language uh, Processing API. And he said, oh, that's funny, so am I. So kind of a, a little bit of a rivalry started. And um, we, so we were competing back and forth. And then when I went to present, my laptop would not connect. And Eric jumped up gave me his laptop, helped me connect, helped move the PowerPoint. And I'm thinking, you know, we have this friendly, friendly rivalry, but this guy has my back. I love Eric. I'm so excited to speak to him live. We actually spent, I think, three days in Paris last year before Super Week. So that was, that was a lot of fun. And that's one of the things I love about Super Week. I like to go a little bit early, spend some time in either Budapest or this time in Paris, ho hopefully Eric, I think we're doing Bruges next, right? Or something like that. So we'll have to, we'll have to consider that. Oh, and I see I'm, I'm going to be running out of time here, which is great because I'm running out of things to say too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you're, when you're on the spot and you're speaking, time can really drag. So here we go. We'll see you after Miroslav's video. I will show you the everyday life activity of an analytics expert based on examples from my everyday life. So what happened when your manager asked you to provide some data to give him weapons to fight the market battle? I will show you what to do. Let's suppose this is the raw data they have asked you to analyze. 
So this raw data contains everything you need to produce the weapon for your market manager, for your sales team, for your company success. First, what you should do with your raw data, you should separate the noise from the information. You should slice and segment the data just to find out where is the gold hidden in all these data points. Let's do it. Let's slice it. Of course, all the time you need the proper tools. Not just any, but the proper tools. Let's go and segment our data. First, we will have to filter out the noise. And we will do it now. Now your marketing manager is ready to fight the battle with the competition. I will show you how my manager is fighting the competition in my neighborhood. Great to see you, Eric. Great to talk to you. Um, and thanks so much for joining me. So my, my partner in crime, my front seat, front row seat mate, and my Paris food tour uh, buddy. So you're going to talk to us a little bit about what's happened with the golden punch card stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. After the, the golden punch, I actually won the silver punch card, which is not the Oh, silver, prize, sorry. It's still a good prize. It's a really nice uh, thing to have in my, uh, my home, especially now we have to work from home a lot, of course. But uh, yeah, I've been developing the project a bit over the past two years. So uh, we'd like to share some uh, recent developments. Oh, nice. So we get, we are both on screen and we have the slides. <laughs> That's really a cool. Cool. Nice. And um, yeah, Fred, you just reminded me, I think my last trip to another country was to Paris with you last year. There you go. Yep. How the world has changed. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Fred, you brought, yeah, you saw my presentation, of course, you know all about NLP. Uh, but uh, there's a brief section in here that's a bit of a recap of the original Golden Punch Card story. Uh, and I'm going to use you for a bit of interaction, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think everybody who watches this knows about the Golden Punch Card competition, but just to uh, give a brief brief like summary of what it is, uh, every Wednesday, I believe, at Super Week, you have the opportunity to share a project. Uh, the only rule is that it should be, like, the code should be public, and anyone should be able to, like, use it after your presentation. Um and uh, there's a lot of good stuff there always. There are good projects on attribution, on marketing and stuff like that. But uh, two years ago, I, uh, or almost three years ago now, I decided to uh, uh, share one of my, like a truly personal project. So that was, that's what uh, this is about. Um, and basically it all has to do with, um, uh, let's see, because now my, yeah. So uh, with this date, so this is the date that one of my favorite artists, um, uh, died. He committed suicide on that date, and his name is Avicii. Uh, and I tried to see if I could use data analysis to, um, uh, yeah, discover a new meaning in his music. And to do that, I used the uh, Natural Language API uh, from Google. And you probably know the Google Cloud Platform. I think it's mentioned quite often in presentations these days. But it's basically a platform that allows you to use the technical services of Google's uh, without actually using Google's interface. Uh, and in my case, I use the natural language processing API. And what natural language processing basically is, is something that allows a computer or a robot to understand our human speech. So when I ask my phone, what's the weather like, it will translate that into some programming language and it knows what to do. So grab information about the weather from today on the location where I live. So it's what you use, uh, for example, Google Assistant for or Siri on iPhone or Alexa from Amazon or some other chatbot. Um, and basically it allows, uh, also allows you to process text for sentiment. So Fred, if I ask you, uh, what is this 
line, I love this t-shirt, a positive, a neutral, or a negative? Positive, positive. Positive, yeah, I agree. This is a t-shirt. Neutral. Yeah. <laughs> I hate this t-shirt. Negative. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I can do the same thing with the API. So it gives me the score, and it also gives you the magnitude, which is a sort of, uh, it shows you how intense the expression is in the lines. Um, so it's basically the difference between I love this t-shirt and I really love this t-shirt. That's basically what they capture with magnitude. And I can do that for all of his songs. So I get the full lyrics of a song and I analyze that for sentiment and magnitude. And I store everything in an Excel file. And what's interesting is that um, one of his albums is called True. And if you're a programmer, you know that True is also a Boolean. So true or false. So uh, the album True was basically identified as a Boolean. So I had to correct for that in data analysis because, of course, I wanted to use it as text, not as a Boolean. So these are the, all the songs of his first uh, three albums analyzed for uh, sentiment. And I can plot this on a sort of scatter plot, which I roughly translate to an emotion grid where you have negative songs on the left, positive songs on the right, the weaker emotion songs on the bottom, and the more strong emotion uh, to the top. And I've also colored the negative ones red and the positive ones greens. So I know that people who are colorblind cannot always identify these colors. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> uh, but uh, the left side is negative, the right side is positive. So this is his first album, which is quite concentrated. This is his second release, which is way more positive. And his last EP before he died was quite balanced, as you can see. It has six songs. It almost uh, It's really well balanced, two on the left, two on the right, two in the middle. Um, and these are all the songs together. But the next step is basically like figure out if this data makes any sense. And the one thing you can do then is something they call a smell test. So it's basically <laughs> looking at the data and thinking like, hmm, does it make sense? Uh, I don't know if you know about spurious correlations, uh, Fred. Have you ever heard about it, spurious correlations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a website I really like. It, it allows you to figure out all sorts of spurious correlations between data points that probably are not really like... Uh, don't have a causal relationship. So this is a good one where the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool apparently correlates with the films Nicolas Cage appears in. I don't think it's true, but it's an interesting correlation. But it's always good to look at the data and see if it really makes sense. So what I normally do with uh, people... We have uh, a couple uh, minutes left, just so yeah. you know. Yeah, so normally you can check the lyrics um, and analyze all them all for sentiment. So you see if they're positive, neutral, or negative. And basically, I ended up using this visual, applying some other colors, and printing that on a T-shirt. And uh, that was uh, what got me like the, the golden punch card at Super Week. And what I did after that it was quite some interesting stuff. I'm speeding up a bit to get through like the cool point in the end. Uh, so I started thinking, can I apply this to other artists? So I applied it to Jack Johnson, which has a cool song about banana pancakes. It's not banana bread, but it's banana pancakes. <laughs> Uh, and this is the result of that, which is pretty interesting. And I now got a script that got, got me from lyrics to like a t-shirt in roughly two hours, which is pretty cool. So I thought, why not try and sell this stuff on a market? But a local market selling t-shirts based on machine learning algorithms, it's not really that uh, like uh, <laughs> uh, understandable. So I sold zero that day. Uh, so I continued working on the project. And uh, on June 6, 2019, his posthumous album came out. So it was an album he was working on uh, and the artists who were working uh, with it uh, finished the album. And I got the same like dots from that analysis, but I wanted to do something different here. So what I did is I created it as a sort of connected dots drawing. So I can have the algorithm connect lines between all the dots. And then using Bezier curves, instead of straight lines, I can make it curved lines. So that it almost looks like a handwritten autograph. So. It's pretty cool. This is fully generated by an algorithm uh, and analyzed uh, in Python. Um, and I, of course, printed that on a t-shirt as well. And when I met you in Paris, uh, uh, Fred, uh, you probably all know Fred. Um, <laughs> I know Fred for three things. He's a GA expert, he's a GTM expert, and he's a GA4 <laughs> expert. And he's also a really nice guy. Mm. And he also talk, talked to me like uh, at Super Week 2019 about this band called Cream. So I thought, Cream? I don't know about Cream. But uh, I made a T-shirt uh, uh, for the like the album Goodbye. So this is Fred wearing a sent like a sentiment analysis T-shirt as well of the band Cream, which is just a pretty cool gift uh, to uh, give to someone. And I also started talking to friends, and he said, "Should you not try to market this?" So I tried a bit with Google Ads, Instagram Ads, Pinterest, but it didn't really work. So um, 
I decided not to market it anymore, just to share it publicly. And then some cool stuff happened. The first thing, I got a message from Kylie, which is a student at MIT in the US. She wanted to make a video about my project. So she made a video on YouTube about my project, which is pretty cool to watch. Um, and she made an analysis of the Chainsmokers, and this is the album. And the Chainsmokers' names are Andrew and Alex. And this really looks like an A, right? So I asked my girlfriend, like, maybe we can make a sweater out of it. So she started embroidering it. So now I have a sweater. I'm also wearing it. It's an embroidered data visualization sweater, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, and it get, gives me better results, for I noticed, for music that I really like. So these are songs I currently made. But the most important thing I wanted to show was this thing. Uh, I got a message from someone on LinkedIn, to, I wanted it a year back, and she asked me if she could get a tattoo of the visual. And I said, yes, of course. So here's a tattoo of the data visualization on someone's body, which is like the biggest compliment I ever get. So how did we get here? Basically, I'm just a small kid, and this was my, the age when Google was, my age when Google was invented, uh, or like I found it. Um, and I was playing with Lego bricks back then, just having a bit of fun, pulling things out of each other, pulling them back into each other. Uh, and now I'm just using tech from Google, which was not designed to create the tools, but accidentally I did, but it was really fun doing it. So my message to everyone who's listening, don't forget to have fun while you're working on these all these cool data technologies. If you want to say hi, visit, uh, talk to me on LinkedIn. If you want to try it yourself, the full project is on GitHub. So uh, that's what I wanted to share. Eric, that's so cool. And I love that tattoo. My God, that, thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. We'll meet in Bruges. Yeah. And speaking of Bruges, which starts with a B, I think next up is the pandemic banana bread. So uh, a little little video. Remember, the kitchen is not my kitchen. It's a backdrop. I have a bigger kitchen than Roberto and Matteo. So, but yeah. Super Week. Welcome to Cooking with Fred. And boy, I wish we were doing this live in Hungary instead of me shooting from my kitchen in Shore, Wisconsin. But it's great to virtually see all of you guys again. And the advantage of filming it, of course, is that I get to have special guests like my special co-star here, Shusha, my favorite little puppy. What we're going to do today is a banana bread. And this is based on a recipe from the New York Times cooking. As a matter of fact, like 90% of it is from their recipe, but I did change a couple of things. First of all, you need some ripe bananas. So these are just about perfect. They're beginning to get the black spots on there. They're not too overdone. And the recipe actually calls for four bananas which the recipe says is more than most banana bread recipes call for. I actually go with five. I've been making this banana bread like every week during the whole pandemic. So I've tweaked the recipe quite a bit and I think it's, it's almost better with five. You don't want a banana that's too beat up like this one is. So this group of five that I have is just gonna be perfect. Because I've got five bananas, I actually cut down a bit the amount of sugar that the recipe calls for. In the recipe, you can also use chocolate chips and walnuts, which I almost always do, and we'll do that today. And then one thing I discovered is that you can add more things. I experimented with cherries and blueberries. The blueberries get totally lost, so I, I stopped that. But the cherries, I add about a cup of frozen cherries, and that makes a huge difference. It also means that you have to cook it slightly longer because of the juice in the cherries, but it's well worth it. I like to get everything set up and ready first, starting with all the dry materials and then moving on to the things that I will actually need to squish together, which we'll be doing shortly, as you'll see. We'll start with the flour, baking soda, and salt and put them into one of our bowls. 255 grams of the flour, one and a half teaspoons of baking soda, half a teaspoon of salt, and mix them all together. The next thing in a second bowl, I add anywhere from 80 to 100 grams of chocolate chips, semi-sweet. 
The recipe calls for, I believe, 135 grams. That feels a bit too much for me. And if you wanted to, you could grind these down a little bit. Otherwise, ones that are this size are going to end up in the bottom of the bread. But I actually don't mind that. But feel free to make these smaller if you'd like. To that same bowl, I add 100 grams of walnuts. And these I do break up into small pieces as much as possible, just to make sure that they get distributed evenly throughout the bread. So there we go. We have 100 grams of walnuts, chopped up kind of, broken apart by hand, and 90 grams of chocolate chips. 190 grams total. Now we're going to move on to the wet ingredients, starting with the bananas, which we are going to peel, break up kind of into chunks, and put them into the bowl. We have an old banana. We have an old banana today. We string beans and onions, kabobs and scallions. Then we're going to take a fork and just start mashing these up. If they're ripe, they'll mash up pretty quickly. We string beans and onions, kabobs and scallions, and all kinds of fruit and say. Next thing we'll want is some butter, and get some good butter, make sure it's unsalted. We want six tablespoons, or about 85 grams, of butter, which we are then going to melt in the microwave. And I do that for 25 seconds or so, depends on the strength of the microwave. Here's the melted butter. We'll just put it into the banana mixture. You don't want to waste any butter, or at least I don't. The next thing you'll want to add is about a third of a cup, or 85 milliliters, of Greek yogurt, just plain Greek yogurt. And I tend to either use the 2% or sometimes the 5%. I rarely use the uh, 0%, the fat-free one. I like to have a little bit of fat in it, as if we don't have enough fat already in it. The next thing we'll add is brown sugar, and you can either use light or dark brown sugar. So a cup is 220 grams. As I mentioned earlier, because I'm using five bananas, I tend to use less brown sugar. So I probably will do about 150 grams on my scale here. It's now set at zero. I've zeroed it out with all the stuff in there. So we're just going to scoop about 150 grams in there. I love having the scale. 156. That's close enough. I'll accept that. We're going to add two teaspoons of vanilla extract, which is probably the most expensive thing in this whole recipe. Make sure you get a good vanilla. You don't want a cheap vanilla. And then finally, two eggs. So there's our mess before we mix it up. Just going to start mixing it. I don't know why I do this, but with this step, I always use a wooden spoon. With the next one, I use a rubber spatula. <laughs> Not sure why I do that. Now we're going to add the first of our dry ingredients, which is the, the flour, the salt, and the baking soda. As I said, I switched to the rubber spatula for this, the all-important rubber spatula. There. Looks about set. I'll add the next bowl of dry ingredients, the chopped walnuts and the chocolate chips. You could stop it here, but we're going to continue with the one cup of frozen cherries. And it's at this point that I start the oven going to 350 degrees. So that's the end of the recipe as per the New York Times version. But here's where I add my extra special, the one cup of frozen cherries, which I think makes it superb. So we'll add that next. I like to get nice organic ones that are also pitted, of course. And I'm going to put these frozen cherries in the microwave for about a minute, enough to get them relatively soft and to get some juice on the bottom. Cherries are ready. You can see the juice on the bottom. And there's still a little bit of ice on them, but it's okay. So what I'm going to do now is basically break each one into two and try to avoid getting cherry juice all over the place. Send me Pete and Dick and Jim. I need help right away. When he got them 
in the store, there was but you bet someone asked for sparrowgrass and then the whole... The cherries are cut. We'll add the rest of the juice. Stir it well to get the juice all incorporated into the rest of the liquid. The reason I break the cherries into two is so that the pieces are big enough to taste when you eat the bread. If you leave them whole, it's too big. If you cut them into fourths, it's too small. So at half, you can taste it, which is great. I've greased a pan, so now I'm going to just pour the mixture into the bread pan. There you hear the oven, it's ready. And now the best part, of course, after you're putting as much of this into the pan as you can, off camera, you get to lick the pan and the spatula. Mm, 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 mm. So good and so healthy. So now you're gonna take the pan and you're gonna put it in the oven for about 75 minutes. So it's a 350. 75 minutes. Once the timer goes off, pull it out and see if it's ready. Nothing is sticking to it, so it is ready. Just let it cool in the pan for a few minutes, and then we're going to take it out of the pan and put it on a rack. And all answers, yes, we've got no bananas. We have no bananas today. You can even eat the chocolate chips that are usually stuck to the bottom. Once it's ready, man, it looks great. You can even see one of the cherries there poking out at the top. Some of the chocolate chips. A nice crust. Man, this thing is so good. I think you guys will enjoy it. And that's Super Week, folks. That's the recipe. Like I said, I've been making it every week during the pandemic. I think it's really delicious. I hope you guys like it. And if you try and experiment and do some other things with it, please let me know. And from Shorewood, Wisconsin, it's Fred and Shusha signing off. Oh, damn, that looks so freaking good. I've got to go home and make, make some tonight. Um, I haven't made it in a couple of weeks, but I have been making it like every week in the pandemic. And, um, you know, totally unrelated, I put on like 40 pounds. So uh, I'm sure it's not related to the banana bread. <laughs> uh, so next up, a person I met last year at Super Week, Anna Lewis from, from uh, the UK, and Ahmad Kanani. So Ahmad took one of my... Um, one of my CXL courses on Excel, no, the GAAPI one years ago and reached out on LinkedIn. And we've we've been friends ever since and have worked professionally since. So I got to meet Ahmad, I think three years ago at Super Week. And he's another front, front row person as is Anna. So really excited to talk to them. And I think we are good to go. All right. Ahmad, good to see you, man. On a time yeah. other than... Um, then with with pickup, please. With fellow motion meetings. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. Good. Uh, keeping busy. Yeah. And so, are you doing stuff other than than for pickup? Because holy cow, they it seems like you're you're doing a shitload of stuff for them. Yeah. So right now they're my biggest client. Um. I have a few more, which are basically implementation, Google Analytics, Tag Manager, et cetera. But they were interesting. Yeah, yeah. Chris is a fascinating guy. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's challenging. And, um, you know, they value the work that we do for them, uh, which is nice. Uh, I don't mind going an extra mile or trying to learn new stuff or, you know, um, try to do something for them that is not based on my core offering. Yeah. Because I actually enjoy it. Yeah. The rest of the project, actually, my guy is taking care of them. Like in oh, nice. Tag manager. And uh, <laughs> apparently, because of Pickup Please, uh, I wasn't able to keep up with everything, Tag Manager, Service Side, GA4, et cetera, you know, over the past six months. But that's fine. I will, I've been learning BigQuery and SQL and, you know, 
Ah, your other, uh, I, I like your uh, glasses, this one. You like this one? Yeah, th this is Japanese, right? The, uh, this is, um, no, they're that. from Salt Lake City. It's called Salt. Salt? S-A-L-T. Oh, this is the one that you had on uh, Super Week last year, right? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that it was Japanese. I I believe that you got it from Japan because <laughs> no, and actually these are my these are my computer glasses, um, so I can see this better. But but they're blue filters and it makes it look weird. Yeah. So yeah. when I'm recording, I don't I don't I don't do use them. Yeah, the, these good. look better. It looks good on you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> So I, ju I just got my vaccine yesterday, the first one, the Pfizer. No way. Pfizer. Yeah. You're lucky. <laughs> I'm very lucky. My wife works at a, um, a health clinic, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not on the list, but, but she said, you know, if you're at the end of the week and you have any spares, which they do occasionally, mm -hmm. please let me know. And so like at 5.30 last night, they called us and said, we have one spare and we have nobody to give it to. So if you can make it down here before six, it's yours. So no I way. made it down. How are you feeling? The arm is a tiny little bit sore, but otherwise it's fine. Oh. What, yeah. When's the last time you left Hungary? Left Hungary? Like, I, I was in Turkey three, four months ago. August. Oh, really? And yeah, you, you remember I joined the calls without the camera? Yes, yeah. It was from my car in Izmir, Turkey, in a parking lot somewhere. I, I don't know. I <laughs> I just brought my wife and family to shopping, and then I, I found a parking lot in a shopping mall. I closed the car's window, and oh it was quiet, and I just sat my office over there. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you guys fly there? You had to fly there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Huh. That Boy, that uh, it's got to be weird to fly. It was weird. So, um, I mean, going from here to, to Turkey was fine. I mean, nobody even asked us who you are. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, I believe there were cameras, uh, automatic cameras for detecting fever. Oh, okay. Uh, at the airport, but uh, there wasn't any, you know, manual check or anything whatsoever. But from Turkey to Hungary, uh, it was more strict. So when we came back, we had to... Uh, stay 10 days in home quarantine. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, But you didn't have to be in a hotel or anything, right? You could be home? Because we have an, we have an apartment and an address that we used to okay. live in. Yeah. Otherwise, people should get a hotel. And it, it's really hard because hotels don't want people from abroad to be quarantined in their hotels. Yeah. For, yeah. for a lot of uh, university students, it, it was a really bad situation. So they arrived in a country that they've had never been before for the first time. They didn't have anywhere to go. Um, they had to find a hotel or someplace, and then they didn't have any kind of credit card or uh, means to buy shopping, you know, groceries online. They didn't know, you know, how things worked around. Yeah. So it was really hard for them. But that, for us, it was fine. We just ordered everything online, the groceries, etc., and yeah, we just stayed at home for ten days. I wonder. Go ahead and speak. One, ah, two, three, there. Check. Yeah. All right. Cool. I, I was I was only getting sound through this one. Now I'm getting it through both, and that's a little bit better. So. Yeah. Cool. So now you don't sound so bad. Now I can actually hear you. Good. <laughs> There's Anna. How are Hello. you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Well, I should have put my Super Week top on, shouldn't I? Yeah, you you can go do, if if it's readily available. You can go grab it. Hmm. So, first year I met Eric. The second mm -hmm. year, Eric was there too, right? And and yep. yeah, the th okay, cool. Last year he he couldn't attend. He wasn't there last year. Yeah. yeah. But that's when we met Julius and, and John. Yeah. 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 And uh, Matteo, it was the first time for Matteo as well. Yeah. Yeah. All of us sitting up in the front. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, really, really glad I went. Um, it was it was nearly a last minute decision, you know, a month to go. I'm so, so glad that I did it. It was one of the best weeks of the year, probably the best week of the year, uh, based on how quickly I went downhill after that. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I'm bringing back the super, super week love today with uh, my swag and my whiskey from uh, <laughs> Matt Gershoft. So, Oh, you won that bottle of whiskey, right? Yes. yes. Oh, oh, my God. I forgot I about that. Mm-hmm. I did not. So, uh, yes, I'm bringing the whiskey to Super Week again. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I'm I'm bringing uh, the coffee, which is not quite as exciting. But if yeah. we could combine the two, that would that would be pretty good, Anna. Yeah, I don't and, drink and, this for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a good time for you to be drinking it. Probably not for me. Yeah, yeah. So, what have you guys been up to? What's new and exciting in in Hungary and in England? Um, well, I mean, I've learned how to, um, how to teach a child to read. Um, I've been homeschooling as well as running a business as well as in the world of analytics. So (laughs) all my new stuff is quite, um, not quite on the line of, uh, the business and that development at the moment. (laughs) Anna, how old is it? How old is your child? She's five. Oh, wow. Mm. And so how's the reading going? Oh, she just refuses. (laughs) She could do it if she wanted to. She really could. Um, but uh, yes, um, it's it's just an effort getting her to sit down and do work. It's, it's harder work than managing a team. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd take I'd take running an office to, to running um, a, a classroom any day. <laughs> no, the, the way parents are, have, you know, been thrust into becoming teachers, uh, that's frightening. Jeez. I, I know. Our poor future. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We we have a, a two and a half year old granddaughter that we we have every Saturday, and boy, that, I mean, she's not obviously doing anything virtual yet, but uh, that would be that would be tough. So it's insane. Yeah, yeah. I'm quite glad I only have the one. I mean, it, it wasn't a plan, but it's worked out for the best. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's been an interesting year so far. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, you're not part of the EU anymore. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I mean, God, what a, what a 12 months it's been. <laughs> so is it finally done yet? Pardon? Is it finally uh, completed? Mm. The, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we had the transition period last year. It was when I was flying back from Hungary last year was sort of the day that it, it started uh, being the official sort of thing, but there was the transition period, so it didn't actually matter too much at that point but it does now Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Um, it's it's probably a good thing that travel is not happening quite so much right now (laughs) i guess uh, i I believe travel is not that much restricted from the uk to the european union anyway not too much harder Uh, so yeah i was still hoping to get out to hungary (laughs) despite brexit but yes mm -hmm. uh, the other issue got in the way (laughs) Is the channel the channel still working right? Does it go? Does it would it go directly, or do you have to go through? I'm I'm acting like such a dumb American because I don't know these things. Um. That's fine. Um, so I'd have to, you know, I normally go to, to um, if we if we're driving, we'll go to Folkestone and then yeah through the Channel Tunnel. Um, that's yeah, that's working. Uh, you know, that would be pretty normal. But um, if there are, you need a few extra documents, um, especially depending on the countries that you're going to. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I've not I've not looked into it recently again because uh, it's it's not very current right now. <laughs> right, right. Um, I mean, it'd be lovely, be lovely to be in Hungary or um, you know up the mountains somewhere. I, I saw uh, so Zali shared a little bit of a video of of uh, Yeshua and in in the in the hotel and walking out the steps and it's like oh god I got so homesick it's oh, like oh, I yeah. really want to. I really want to be there and go back, but yeah, all the so, Facebook memories that come up and <laughs> just yeah. Yeah. So what what are you doing with your team, Anna? How is that How is that going remotely? And um, stuff? We reduced the size of the team a little bit last year um, to just streamline it and remove a few like risks um, so that we could stay a little bit uh, have a better safety net if the work dried up for a bit. Um, it got pretty quiet last summer, but at the moment I've got um, two and a half on the team um, and we're 
um, all working from home and just making sure that we have uh, a lot of video catch ups and um, yeah. yeah, just just staying in contact that way. So yeah, yeah, we're we're getting by. It's it's working <laughs> at the moment. So that's, well, that's good. good. Yeah. 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 It was it was really scary here in like March April the business dried up a fair amount but uh, things have picked up now which is which is good yeah, yeah we had the same yeah. yeah at the beginning I guess uh, the majority of companies they kind of freaked out and tried to cut down on the cost so you know they can be ready for any risks whatsoever so just to stick to the uh, bare minimum in terms of cost of you know operating the business because you know there was so much uncertainty you know ahead but you know as it uh as it passed a few more months then they started i mean they they, they had to start operation again and their team they they started figuring out how to manage their team or maybe their client came back again and yeah it really and, depends and what us again and what <laughs> yeah. sectors yeah yeah <clears throat> We had a couple I of had the same there. issue. So I, I lost two of my clients at the beginning of the COVID around, um, was it around April mm-hmm. uh, for about two and a half months, but both of them, they came back right now. So Oh, good. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we, 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 we were about to sign a project and start a project with a big restaurant company in the UK. Um, who immediately had to pull the plug and a holiday company as well. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that that made things quite quiet to start with, but it gave us time to cope um, and to just, uh, you know, work out what it would look like to work yeah. from home and everything without being restaurant and holiday companies. There, there. Yeah, it was it was it was a bad this. set of you know it was it was unfortunate because um, mm-hmm. that's rare. Normally, normally we're you know pure e-commerce. Yeah. Yeah, we had a travel company that we were doing a lot of stuff with. And, and of course, that just, I mean, I feel so bad for them. But we had the the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program here in the in the U.S. And we got we got one of those loans. And there was some, um, there's been some, you know, people that shouldn't have gotten it or whatever. But, oh, my God, that was a lifesaver for us. That was yeah. so wonderful. Yeah, just knowing that you weren't going to go into the red. Yeah, yeah, yeah I did the same and furloughed the employees. So, you know, where we didn't have the work in, um, the government were able to pay um, the employees wages. So I was the only one working for a bit um, with a kid around um, and uh, going through a miscarriage and lockdown and all of that. It was quite a stressful time. Oh, uh, Anna, I'm so sorry. That's okay. It's, I mean, it's probably for the best because can you imagine having a newborn baby and a (sighs) five-year-old homeschooling and running a business and my husband running a business. <laughs> so yeah. actually, it's probably a blessing in disguise um, that, yeah, uh, yeah, I had two last year. Um, and that's, you know, in lockdown. It's it's one of those difficult things to go through. But a lot of people do. A lot of people had to. Um, and I'm just I'm just super grateful for what I've got. That's the thing that last year taught me is just to be so grateful for, mm. for everything I have and everything that well, you have. Yeah. Without getting all mushy and emotional. That. <laughs> No, but you're right. It, it, it yeah. makes you appreciate what you have. But oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Jeez, what a it was, what it was a shit a year. What a shit yeah, year. Okay. To be honest, weirdly, it was it was actually 2020 was actually better for me than 2019. Really? Oh my mm. god! Oh. I don't think I ever want to ask about 2019. 2019. Absolutely, like because that, um, that was the that was when I had a, my first miscarriage, and I just ended up with chronic fatigue, celiac disease diagnosis trying to run a company it was uh that was absolutely the lowest of low so actually you know 2020 <laughs> i found better than 2019 <laughs> so i really again that just uh, shows me that you know I'm, I'm grateful i'm grateful for you know my business my flexibility being able to sort of rely on my team rely on the fantastic people in the industry and the network um to help out and you know and get our back if if we need it um and you know keep passing clients who um you know suit us nicely so yeah loads to be grateful for yeah so, yeah turned out all right so hopefully 2021 <laughs> will still pick up it's got to be better anna it's got to be better yeah. yeah absolutely and and 2022 when we see each other at super week it'll be even better yet it's gonna be brilliant hopefully. it's gonna be brilliant yeah. right <laughs> Speaking of conferences, you were at, uh, you you crashed Measure Camp North America. 
<laughs> right? Did I? <laughs> I saw your name. I, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to crash oh, Merge Camp North America. <laughs> I mean, I sort of crashed the London one. Um, in that I was, I was there. I was sort of uh, helping out um, with the with the London or the UK sort of Europe one that was virtual a couple of weeks ago. And you know, when it came to the sort of closing presentation, and everybody got, uh, tuned into a screen, and I hit the wrong button and showed myself on camera to everybody. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, it, it took over everybody's screens for a couple of seconds to like, work out which button it was not to. It just <laughs> made me panic that I've done the same in in the whole of America, but. Um, <laughs> Hopefully not. No, um, no, I, I, I missed the American one, unfortunately. Ah, uh, okay. What about you, Anna? What have you been working on besides teaching your five-year-old how to read? <laughs> yeah, just juggling. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, there's, there's been a, a, a little bit of a lot of things, really. Um, so it's been a shame not to be able to have a big thing to get really, really stuck into. But you know, we're getting practiced in the GA four implementations. A bit of um, the more in earth GTM, uh, looking at the staff, looking at um, building a uh, Shopify app for some sort of oh, uh, wow. refunds into Google Analytics, that sort of tracking. So um, between us on the team, you know, we've got a few different projects on the go, but, um, you know, uh, where things are a little bit stressful, we end up prioritize client, prioritizing client work and um, just coping. So I do wish I'd had a lot more time to do, you know, some kind of development and more learning and you know this was something I took away from what you spoke about at um, Super Week last year was well how much of your time uh, you know are you dedicating to uh, developing your own self and keeping your hands um, you know stuck into everything and all of that and you know we were pouring over a spreadsheet and I was just thinking to myself I need more time for just me not just spreadsheets not just clients not just GTM, but taking it further and doing that um, yeah yeah. yeah, I've had to prioritize coping with life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's quite important, but I'm, yeah, I'm enjoying dabbling around with, with things um, without even, you know, without taking them too far. So yeah, a little bit of knowledge and everything. It's, it's been fun. Um, but Good. yeah, there's certainly been a lot thrown at us this year. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. This year has been crazy. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I've been diving a lot into GA4 and, and, you know, when a, like a client meeting or an internal meeting comes up, it's like, no, no, I'm in, I'm, I'm in this right now. Don't, don't interrupt it. So, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Never get long enough to actually look into it. There's always too much other stuff, you know, that the business needs you to do. Or, yeah. Yeah. But Every, everything is going that. just up from a, from an update point of view and the tools that we used to be using, they are just moving too quickly. It's yeah. like, Google has found some extra time and hired some people remotely to just start and develop some stuff mm. to just, you know, uh, start, you know, pushing updates to GA4 every week and A2 mm -hmm. Studio and Tag Manager and Server Side. It's, it's a time for them to just push updates because if you think of it this way, GA was like that for like at least 12 years. Right. I know it's yeah. more than uh, older than that, but yeah. the, the new GA that we know and uh, we kind of love because we know how to <laughs> work with right. it. Right. It's at least 10 years old and yeah. there was nothing actually changing. And also Google Tag Manager, it was quite, it was kind of a steadily growing yeah. some concept. new features. And now they're going like this. And <laughs> if you just miss it, uh, you're a guru you, right now and you're a newbie a year later. Which well, yeah. Is yeah, I totally what? get that because I kind of feel like that. I've had to take a step back for the family, the health, running a business. And I'm like, oh, shit, thanks for throwing the GA4 launch on us. Like, And <laughs> now literally all my clients are going, oh, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And I'm like, wow, stop doing your breaking things. <laughs> and oh god yeah i just want to press pause a little bit and catch up but um yeah um that's that's not really an option i don't think no yeah it's not an option. yeah i know unfortunately but 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 yeah you're right there things have changed so much in in 2020 i mean there's so much advancements in all the tools that we use it's like holy crap and then this I don't let's not even get into google ads and cookies and privacy and all that stuff too i mean it's like yep. holy 
any yeah. rate. Yeah. yeah. All right, you guys. Thank you so Thank much. You really appreciate it, for... man. This was yeah. this was awesome. Good to connect. Yeah. yeah. All right. Likewise, it's good to chat. Yeah. Uh, See you guys. Very much. Cheers. Bye. 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 I love Anna and Ahmad. Oh man, what a fun conversation to listen to again. And I'm so glad that they could join me. So next are some other great people that I met at Super Week, of course. And you know, I'm beginning to think all my best friends are, are from Super Week. I don't know if that's a good a good sign or a bad sign. But next there is uh, Julius Federer Vicious, which uh, I'm sure I butchered again, and Johnny McGowan or John McGowan, Johnny Wandering. Um, so one of the things that happened, at least since I've been going to Super Week, is, is the late night jams. And last year, uh, John and Julius and I were jamming for a bit with lots of people around singing, which is, oh my God, just such a cool part of Super Week. And so we decided that the band name, and of course, we're going to form a band and travel around Europe. And unfortunately, uh, COVID put a, put a stop to that, which is a shame because, you know, we would have sold out everywhere, I'm sure. Uh, so the band name, of course, was going to be Julius and the Analytics Maniacs, but um, we're still maniacs. We're just not a band. First of all, thanks for thanks for joining me here. I mean, I wish we were all live at Super Week, obviously, but uh, but we're not. But this is almost just as cool. The uh, the reunion of the Julius and the Analytics Maniacs <laughs> band. So <laughs> I forgot that name. <laughs> Thanks for yeah, so this is the beginning of our of our world tour. And I actually, well, not only am I wearing the Super Week shirt, of course, um, which only use losers aren't wearing, John. <laughs> Sorry. You your Super Week shirt, but I, I, but I, I got my I got my vaccine <laughs> yesterday. I got the first vaccine yesterday. Oh, oh awesome. That's cool. Nice. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So that was that's pretty awesome. So any fluiness? Any any uh my arm's a little field. bit sore, but otherwise it's no big deal. Cool. cool. Nice. Yeah, Good the stuff. Pfizer. I got the Pfizer. So February 19th, Congrats. I get the second one. Cool. You don't seem to be too dead. So I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah. so how are you guys doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, we get, I guess that... Um, I feel kind of like a super weak hangover. I mean, like, well, not... The hangover probably is the wrong word here, but like uh missing like uh, really miss uh, miss the, the mountaintop even though i was only one time uh <laughs> like last year but i'm definitely looking forward to 2022 and i hope that we will all get that this stuff sorted out and definitely will go go on the mountaintop yeah yeah certainly i'm i'm very much missing it it was like last year was almost a <clears throat> it coincides with the date that i first like i got my first freelance role so it's like as soon as a year finishes it's around the same time that Super Week is. And so I celebrated it last year mm. and I would have loved to have celebrated it this year, obviously. But uh, yeah, it's, um... oh, we'll get there soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I miss seeing everybody, miss the presentations. But uh, so, so the next time we go to Super Week, we're going to be traveling. And Julius, I understand you have some information on traveling after COVID. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Um, God damn it. Uh, like uh, expectations are wrong on the wrong level. Come on. No, 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 no. I said that I have a segment and, and I mean, I have prepared some slides for a segment which is related to travel. 45 minute presentation but... <laughs> is what I heard. <laughs> but not like how to travel after or do, during <laughs> COVID. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, but yeah, let me just quickly. Sh the top 10 I rules for traveling in COVID. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Like a quick, a quick, uh, like um, context. So um, I, I, I'm not planning any travels for now, right now. I mean, like when, when stuff uh, like, when the problems go down, I mean, like when, when, uh, when everything becomes more easier, then uh, <clears throat> I might consider like start thinking about that. So, like last year after the first lockdown, what happened is that uh, like we could not travel like abroad, so we decided like, hey, let's travel like in, in, in the country. So since I'm from Lithuania, let's try let's travel uh, Lithuania like to to the different regions. So apparently. My country is great. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm, I'm, re I'm really happy. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I, I found out, like, a lot of cool stuff and life, a lot of places to visit. So I decided, like, hey, why don't I use 
and prepare a quick segment to sell something and sell the idea of maybe having, well, Lithuania on your wish list for your next, I don't know, maybe top five countries that I would like to visit, that you would like to visit. So uh, you and... Sold. and your... Shut up and take my money. I, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wish you could, uh, I don't know, uh, pretend that you, you, you are hard to get. So please okay. allow me to... <laughs> uh, Tell us yeah. more. Let well, me... and, and so when did you get this new job on the tourist board? <laughs> Uh, I'm actually like uh, an intern there, so I guess that I should do that <laughs> soon enough. Um, yeah, so I would like to share my screen. Anyway, so uh, Vilnius, yeah. So uh, first of all, I would like to start with a really cool, in my opinion, uh, like promo campaign that was done by the, uh, by the city like several years ago. And it was like very widely covered like by other like news outlets. So this is really cool. So Vilnius and uh, like it was, it's like slogan at that, during that campaign was the G spot of Europe. <laughs> And in my opinion, this is this is, this this was brilliant. But of course, wow. like church and like the Catholic, uh, like more, more hardcore Catholics, they were against that because this is not how you should like how are you supposed to uh, promote the city? But this was actually quite funny, and like it, even the visuals were really good. For example, in this case, this lady is holding like is gripping the map exactly where Vilnius is. So Vilnius, no the G spot of Europe, and you might be wondering, like Chilius, why is Vilnius G spot of Europe? And this is the best part. Nobody knows what it is. <laughs> But when you find it, it's amazing. Oh. This is genius, in my opinion. This is genius. So, like, I think that we, we um, like, since, uh, like, this is for the intro. And now let's take a look, a, a, a quick peek at five things that you can see in, or do in Vilnius. Of course, there are many more, but, like, let's just, like, keep it, uh, keep it brief. So, so, but the G spot, that's like the Google spot, right? That's what it means. That's what they're talking about. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yes, you right. could look yes. at this like <laughs> from that perspective, I guess. Yeah, maybe G4 <laughs> spot if you wanted. I'm like, it depends on you, but yeah. So, uh, anyway, let's go to those five things. So, what you see in Vilnius, as you can see, uh, poorly formatted PPT. Uh, so, Gediminas Castle and Old Town. This is really, looks, Ooh, wow. looks really cool. So, basically, uh, it is on a hill. This is a very old castle. Actually, the one of the tower of the of the of large castle, but only the tower survives. So, if you go on top of it, you will see the panorama of the city, and you will see the old town, and you will see the downtown, and all this other stuff. You can also see uh, the TV tower uh, somewhere far away. And I think I probably live somewhere there, but I'm not sure. Or maybe. <laughs> Is somewhere in that district. Also, one other another thing. Like, here's how that the old town looks from from the above. And uh, we are actually like uh, have a lot of businesses uh, related to hot air balloons. Like, we are like one of the probably very few uh, capital cities that allow hot air ballooning because we have also the airports. So somehow they must not interfere with mm -hmm. uh, with each other. So uh, I mean, like uh, we. During the summer, you will see views like this like every day, and this is like nothing like uh, you know nothing special for us, but for tourists like definitely a, a a cool view. And if you have a correct wind direction, you will fly over the old town, over the downtown, and so on. And like views like this, I mean the usual stuff. And but yeah, for tourists definitely great. Oh my then God. we have a TV tower, and even in this picture you have that bloody balloon. Uh, but um, <laughs> and you might photoshopped. Uh, Maybe color <laughs> correction is that? Oh, I mean, if you're talking about the balloons, so no, this is yeah, like, okay. like legit. Uh, so you might be thinking like, hey, well, whatever, like many cities have TV towers. Well, yeah, but we apparently we do a lot of stuff with this tower. So for example, two years ago, we had uh, like 100 year anniversary of our Independence Day. So we turned this into a huge flagpole. Uh, <sighs> and then uh, every year during Christmas, we turn this into a highest in the world Christmas tree. <laughs> uh, I mean, in this photo, it might not wow. look very good, but like in, in real life, it, it looks pretty cool. And also, while I was Googling for pictures, I remembered like even weirder thing that was done like 15 years ago. Uh, it was for World Basketball Championship. And what happened is that for some reason, we decided to do this. We turned this tower into a huge basket. Like this is not Photoshop. This is real photo. Oh, my God. So, and, and these fireworks I would like because they were launching in like this stuff. So like. 
I mean, yeah. And also, we are crazy for about basketball, and like this is like a second religion. Uh, yeah. How did they get? How did they get the fireworks to make the word al- alami? That's that's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think this is like like a like a secret. Uh, like uh, I don't know. Uh, you, you, you should you should actually c- c- come to Lithuania and find out because during winter yes. we have like snowflakes in shape of alami and a letters, and they just fall down. <laughs> I thought wow. all snowflakes were unique, but these look identical. <laughs> <laughs> Another unique thing, like I'm, like everywhere else, they are different, but in Lithuania, they're all like a a a. Anyway, and the next thing is like cathedral. Another thing you might think like, hey, like whatever, like there are like more beautiful cities in Europe uh, that have like more historical buildings. Yeah, wow. but if you come once again in the Christmas season, like I mean between Christmas and New Year's, uh, what happens is that even this year we did that, but with uh, a lot of restrictions we have a huge uh christmas tree and every year that changes so like this like um this is a huge christmas tree uh then uh there are a lot of like um like um like souvenir shops or something like that and you can see like a lot of people and yeah uh then oh this God. is how it looks like from the inside and like every year we change <laughs> and it's snowing again yeah, and uh, every year the, the theme changes. For example, one year it was like a little ha- house or something like that. Um, yeah, then we have um, lots of beer. Like definitely, like, like we have a like, huge like, <laughs> beer culture. So if I'm not, if if, if you ha- like, if you were not sold uh, like uh, three uh, slides uh, ago, I think that if you are into beers, you will definitely love uh, our beers because like they have won a lot of awards and uh, yada yada yada. Uh, John, yeah, you're so- sold, right? I am pretty much, I'm buying tickets now. I'm actually, <laughs> you know, it's actually illegal to leave the UK at the moment, but I'm making a point of, I got some friends. Well, <laughs> wait till I, well, wait till I share my top 10 tips on how to leave the country during COVID <laughs> and see, <laughs> unnoticed. On how to cross the border, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how to cross the border. Uh, like, especially having the Brexit in time, and like how to come back later. Anyway, yeah, so the next thing is, this is, this is not in, in Vilnius, but this is like, uh, 50, 30 kilometers, like 15 miles away from Vilnius. Uh, this is like a castle, and you might think, again, like, what's the point? This is just a castle. Well, this castle is cool because it's on the, on the island. Oh, my God. So the, the view is actually Sick. really cool as well. And during the night, the view is also really cool. Uh, and, yeah, apparently this is it. And thank you for your time. And this is Achu. This is thank you in Lithuanian and pronounce Achu. So basically when we thank, we sneeze, apparently. <laughs> Achu. 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 Uh, yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah. Bless you. Wow. That's fabulous. <laughs> that is <Thank> awesome. <laughs> I, I mean, seriously, I really want to go there. John, we should, we should meet up there. That can be uh, beautiful. If, Let's go if, for it. We're definitely going to Lithuania. Yes. We, we want to hit. We want to hit Eastern Europe. We're going to hit Prague. Lithuania will definitely be on the on the list now too. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because like, be fun. yeah, because in general, like, um, like, I don't think that. I mean, Lithuania can be like your single destination country, but it's, it's better, I guess, like to spend to dedicate like let's say three four days for a country, and and then go to another country. So like three four days or like maybe yeah probably four days will be packed like action packed in Lithuania and then you go to another country. So yeah. Yeah. Like that. Cool. Cool. I'd love to do that. Yeah. John, seriously, when, when we do it, you ought to join us. We can, we can all crash at Julius's. I'm sure he won't mind to have, you know, 12 people with my his... current apartment. No, but I'm hard. <laughs> I'm working hard. And I think, I, I mean, I hope that I, when you are actually doing that, maybe I will have like more, more space and yeah, you could crash. Yeah, I think you're going to buy your house like the month after John and I are there. So you're going to time <laughs> it to make sure that <laughs> we don't crash. Yeah, yeah. This is like 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 my main reason why I'm buying the house. I mean, uh, why why I would like to buy the house to support you guys. <laughs> yeah, but this but this house doesn't have in, like a storage for all the instruments for the you know the analytics maniacs. So I don't think it fits into our, our plans, honey. Uh, I think. <laughs> oh yeah. no, but I mean, like you know, it, it should be it should, it should be double garage, like for the two cars. So I think I could find the space. Yeah, perfect. We have a lot of instruments, Julius. I don't think a double garage is going to cut it. Yeah, but we have no songs, so I guess you know. Uh, <laughs> That's probably why our album sales haven't been that good. We haven't released any music. 
Yeah, I yeah. think that, yeah, I think that it's, it's all the album you have to have the album. That's the problem. I haven't thought of that actually. <laughs> Eureka! Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so how about we meet at the next Super Week and then we decide like with the name of our first song, not the actual song, but the name for the song, like the song title. Oh, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Let's record yeah. Our, our first album at Super Week. All right. Oh my God, guys. Well, I think we have more than enough for Zali. I think, yeah. So we wanted to talk about G4, but yeah, let's just keep that Chinese thing away. Speaking of Zali sending things, Julius, did you get a Super Week keychain? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you did, huh? How about you, John? Did you get a Super Week keychain? Uh, yes, I believe so. It arrived really. Very Both quickly. you guys got it. Well, but that's Fred, really Fred, interesting you because a vaccine. So you know. <laughs> I guess I'd rather have the vaccine, but Zolly, <laughs> send me the damn keychain. <laughs> Where's my goddamn keychain, yeah, right. I'm going to hold this video hostage until you send me the keychain. <laughs> oh, my God, you guys. All right. Love All right. my bandmates. You guys are great. Yeah, so, analytics Maniacs. Uh, Julius and that Analytics Maniacs signing off. Signing off. Take yeah. care, guys. Bye. See Let's see. How do I do this? <laughs> Trying to sign off. It's still Always recording. It's still part. recording. <laughs>Oh, man, I cannot believe how much fun Julius, John, and I had. I was laughing along with all the terrible jokes. I'm still laughing. You know, that's that's the sign of a terrible comedian laughing at your own jokes. So uh, that's me. Um, I think I think the bond you see here with, with Julius and John, with Anna and Ahmad, is just so typical of, of Super Week. I mean, the, the fact that we all end up in the mountains in Hungary, isolated together and just having one hell of a good time. So it's Zali, thank you so much for starting Super Week, for continuing it, for doing this Super Week TV. Uh, so next up, <laughs> we've got to get down to a little bit of analytics, right? So um, next up is a session I'm doing on on uh, repurposing UA events in GA4 and, and what's the best thing to do there. So I think that video is about ready to to run. I will just speak slowly here and wait for it to, to start. So it's, it's almost here. The, the tension.
In this session, we're going to look at GA4, which is an events-driven analytics package, and the events in Universal Analytics. As I'm sure you know, all the hit types in Universal Analytics are different. There is a hit type for page view, for commerce, for transactions, for events, etc. By contrast, everything in GA4 is an event, and it has an event name, like page view, and an event parameter, like page title, page location, refer, etc. If you're a digital analyst like me, who believes that the heart and soul of a really good UA implementation is the events, the event category, the event actions, the event labels that you've set up, what are you supposed to do with GA4? Are you supposed to just throw all those UA events away? Well, in many cases, yeah. But man, there's some really good information in those UA events, the way you've set them up and the things you're tracking, the important user interactions that you're tracking across your website. So let's look at how we can repurpose some of those UA events and what we should do with them in GA4. We're going to start off by looking at GA4 event types, the four different types, and spend particular time with the recommended events. Then we're going to look at UA events, Universal Analytics events, and see how we can repurpose them, if necessary, for GA4. We'll do that by looking at an example and the steps to follow for this process. And finally, we'll end up with some resources. There are four different GA4 event types. The first are automatically collected events. You don't have to do anything as long as GA4 is installed on your website these are automatically collected. Currently, there are 42 in total. 34 of those are app-related, which makes sense given that GA4 was app and web, and so there's a whole bunch of app-related events in there. There are also eight web-related automatically collected events, like page views, scroll, session start, etc. And of those eight, Six of them are the enhanced measurement GA4 event types. And these are probably familiar to you if you've set up GA4. These are the ones that come automatically. They're turned on by default. You can configure them to the tiny extent in that you can turn them off if you want to, all except page views. Page views will always be on. And you can also configure the site search if it's not tracking the type of site search that you are using. The third type of GA4 event is the recommended. There are a number of recommended events that apply to all properties, either web or app, or that are specific to particular industries. For example, retail e-commerce, jobs or real estate, travel, games, etc. Now you may think, oh, this is great. If I happen to be a real estate type property, for example, if in GA admin, I go in and set my industry category as real estate, then the real estate recommended events will automatically apply. Well, nope, that's not actually the case. The recommended events are just there if your website or your app happens to have features or behaviors that correspond to those events. So there's nothing automatic in the recommended events that get applied to your website. You have to set them up but Google has provided a template or a format, a structure, for you to be able to use. The fourth type of GA4 events are the custom events. And in the custom events, you create your own event name and your own event parameters. Now I will say Google is really trying hard to get you not to use custom events. Again, if we look at their documentation for the recommended events, they're saying, please use these because you'll get more detailed reports and you'll benefit from the latest analytic features and integrations as they become available. That's a key word. There's really no advantage right now to the recommended versus custom, but as they become available, there might be some advantages. So might as well use the recommended ones. So those are the four different types of GA4 events. Now let's look at what we can do with Universal Analytics events. And this whole process is going to be related to how lucky you feel. You're in luck if you have no UA events at all. You're not tracking any Universal Analytics events. So here's your top events report in Google Analytics. 
and you have a flat line. There's absolutely no events being tracked. So if this is you, you're in luck because the enhanced measurement is going to give you way more information in GA4 than you're currently tracking now. You're also in luck if you're way overboard in what you're tracking. For example, this account in the event category has over 5,400 rows. That's just crazy. If you're a disciple of Brian Clifton and have read his books like I have, you'll know you want to keep the event category, which is a big bucket of things, you want to keep that to 10 or maybe 20 maximum. Certainly not 5,400. This is just ludicrous. It's impossible to get information out of an account like this. So in this case, if this is you, you're better off because now you're just going to have those six main enhanced measurement events. You're kind of in luck if you use GTAG. If you're using the global site tag to track page views, you can also send events into Google Analytics. And the events are of this structure where you specify the event, and that's going to be the event action. And then you add the event category, the event label, and the value if you want. So if you have a GTAG event set up, for example, if you're tracking clicks on social media icons, as long as you set up GA4, those GTAG events will get sent into GA4. Just as a reminder, here's what the GTAG event tracking will look like. In this case, here's what that'll actually come out to. So event is follow Facebook. Again, if we click over here, event category, social media, etc. And if we look at the HTML for this particular page, that's exactly what's set up here. So let's take a look at this live. Let's look at this demo site. In the footer are those social media icons. If I inspect them, that'll open up the developer console and you can see the GTAG event that's right there. To show how this works, I'm going to use David Vallejo's GTMGA debug tool and initialize it. And now that's going to show us the events in GA and in GA4. So if I click on the Facebook icon, in the GA tab, I get the event, the social media, follow, etc. So here's my event category, social media, event action, follow Facebook, event label, footer. If I go to the GA4 tab, you'll see the event, follow Facebook. Let's look at that. So it's a custom event category. The event name is follow Facebook. The event category is social media. The event label is footer. So that one GTAG event sent a GA event to Universal Analytics and to GA4. So that works pretty cool. And this ET, by the way, is the engagement time. It's another factor that tells you whether the user is engaged or not. The important thing to remember here is that it works and that the event action from the GTAG event becomes the event name in the GA4. And that actually strikes me as a little strange because I would expect the event category to become the event name, but that's not the way it works. And finally, your SOL if you're using Google Tag Manager. So all those great Google Analytics events that you've set up in Tag Manager, all that wonderful tracking of the user interactions on your website that you're tracking via GTM, none of those will come over to GA4 by default. So let's look at an example of some UA events and see how and if we're going to move them over to GA4. I'm also going to talk about the process by which you would do this. The first step you're going to do is review existing UA events. And we're going to continue with our social media share example that we just looked at. So this is the actual Northwood site. In the footer, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. If you go to a blog article, you can share that blog on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Or, from that same blog article, you can click to tweet a pull quote. So three different ways of tracking social media interactions from our website. This is what the tag manager looks like. The social media click to tweet, follow, or share. The first thing you're going to want to do with your UA events is take the Marie Kondo approach and look at each of those events and ask yourself if it brings you joy, if it sparks joy. 
In my case, that first one, the click to tweet, yes, that brings a lot of joy. The third one, the share, that brings some joy. The middle one, the social media follow, that really doesn't bring much joy. It's time to jettison it. I'm not going to move it over to GA4. So now we have two events that we are going to move over to GA4. The next step is to look at the GA4 recommended events. And remember, we want the GA4 recommended events because they provide forward compatibility with future functionality. We definitely want that. So let's start by looking at the event names for all properties. And one kind of jumps out, share. That's what we want. We want to share content. So it has two different parameters, content type and item ID. But you know what? That may not seem like enough. So content type might be blog and item ID might be the actual article that we're sharing. But it seems to me that that's not enough. And by pure happenstance, I was looking at the measurement protocol for GA4, and I noticed that they have another parameter in there, the method. And this actually works quite well. So this would tell me whether it was a click to tweet or a share to LinkedIn. It would tell me the type of content. It would tell me the actual blog article that got shared. So that takes us to step three, plot your UA events to the GA4 version. So the event name is going to be share. The method is going to be one of, I guess, four different things, share to Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, or click to tweet. The content type in this case is just going to be blog, and the content ID is going to be the blog name. Next step is to repurpose the GTM triggers. I already have them set up. They're already firing UA events. I'm just going to reuse them. I probably don't have to do anything to them. I'm just going to totally reuse them. But I am going to create a new GA4 event, and that's going to have the event name of share, the different parameters that we've already decided on, and I'm going to hard code blog because that's really the only thing I'm tracking here the page path, and then the click class is something that I have in the HTML that'll tell me what type of share that is. And then we have the two different triggers. Next thing I'm going to do is test it. Let's go live to do our testing. We're going to go to the Northwood site. I'm going to switch the GA debugger to on. This is a Google Chrome extension, so it's on. And now it's going to be sending information to my analytics account in the debug area. So let's go ahead and send some events into GA4. We'll go to the blog. Let's pick the one we've been working with. I'm going to click on the share icons. And also the click to tweet. We can close these down now. And let's do another blog as well. Okay, so we've sent some traffic to GA4. Let's go into our debug view. And you can see the shares that have happened. Let's click on that. And that's going to give us all the share information. Let's start by looking at the content type. That's going to be blog. Everything that we've shared is from a blog. The next thing we're going to look at is the item ID. And there's the first blog. There's the second one. So you can see I've been clicking around quite a bit. And then we'll look at the methods. So we shared on Facebook. We shared on Twitter. We shared on LinkedIn. And we did the quote click to tweet. Everything appears to be working we have the proper events being sent to GA4. The next step you'll want to take is to register the parameters. The parameters we are using, of course, are the item ID, the content type, and the method. We need to register those, and let's go back into GA4 to do that. You register a parameter by going to All Events and Manage Custom Definitions. And you can see that I have them set already. I've got content type, item ID, and method. If you hadn't registered them yet, you would go to Create Custom Dimensions and enter the parameter name, spelling it exactly the same way you're using it in GTM. For the custom dimension name, you can use the same event parameter name or use another name if you want it to be more descriptive in the reports. 
So the fact that they're registered means I can call them up in the GA4 UI. And let's take a look at that. We're looking at the share event, and here are our registered parameters, the content type, the method, and the item ID. So all appears to be working. We've taken two UA events and repurposed them for GA4. We see that they're working, they're coming into GA4, and they're showing up in the reports. That's pretty cool. Let's wrap up by looking at a few resources. The page that I refer to the most for the recommended events is this analytics help one that shows you all the different types of events. Also the measurement protocol one that has the list of all the events, including the share, which had that extra parameter of method. Finally, if you go to my blog post, should GA4 be your only analytics, at the end of that, I have links to some significant resources, including um, the Google documentation, Charles's course at, at CXL. Julius has published a number of blogs recently on GA4. He's also rewritten his GTM training to use all GA4 examples. So definitely follow him. For sure, follow my blog. I have some great setup tips that you should use. And you're probably going to be looking at e-commerce, so you can get a link to the Google documentation, CMO's EEC guide, and then Mateo has a really nice UA to GA4 EEC conversion. Also, other people have mentioned KenWilliams.com, who's got great resources on GA4, and the GA4BigQuery.com, which is a list of sample queries that you can use when you're diving into BigQuery if you're not a SQL guru. Thanks so much. Feel free to follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and hope to see you all soon.
compass was wrong And I'm still on my way Closer each day to where I belong I'm still rolling the dice Praying sometimes I don't last it long I'm losing my faith I'm walking away from what you knew all along Mama told me before you leave If there's only one thing you remember from me Child, when you're out on your own A million miles from home Feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders Child, don't forget who you are Don't lose your head or your heart I bet my life on your stars You'll be dancing, dancing on the Welcome back, and we are live from Milwaukee, and actually, I have no idea, Jim, where you're located. Where, where is that? <laughs> yeah, the lobby of the hotel, of course. <laughs> I am not hearing Jim. Is, is Jim's mic on? I'm not hearing him. Okay, it's not me. <laughs> Still not. Can you hear me now? Oh, there. Woohoo. <laughs> hey. You know, yeah, so all I had to do was unplug it and plug it back in. There you go. That that always works. At least you didn't have to turn it off. So um the um you know, di- uh poetry about about analytics would be difficult if the mic was not on. So I'm glad you have the mic back on. Yeah. So like I was going to say, we are live. <laughs> you can tell because we already had technical difficulties. So uh, Jim, I don't know if you've seen the picture of the control panel where these guys are running this from. Did you, have you seen that? No, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, man. Well, testing, Jim is reconnecting <laughs> there. And we're we reconnecting now. Yeah. Did that work? Yeah, that did. did that you can hear me? I can hear you. Oh, huh, okay. I'm happy to be heard. <laughs> so <laughs> at any rate, that that uh that control room that that uh they're doing this from, it looks like NASA. It looks like mission control. It does. Which I mean it is, of course, but uh it's pretty cool. So Jim Stern, welcome to my little segment of Super Week TV. It's so cool to have you here. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I, I do start off, however, with bad news. I got in. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Petra, can I can I disconnect him now, please? <laughs> <laughs> you want to you want to drop a a postal address in the chat and and we can make it. You know, so so I told Zali, as you know, I'm I'm you know kind of hurt and upset that I don't have the 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 super week keychain, and everybody on Twitter says, "Oh, I got mine, I got mine," and so he showed me a photo of the mailing slip, um, but you know that's not the that's not the keychain, so. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm hearing in the chat that it's still on the way. Sure, sure. I'll pick it up next year in, in Hungary, no doubt. <laughs> so, Jim, 
We had extensive preparation on the questions that you wanted me to ask you for this. So absolutely. What's new? <laughs> uh, your vaccine. Is that's new? Well, yeah, so that is. California is a mess where there is there is no. The distribution is all over the map. My sister in law got it. Any trouble? My ninety three year old father isn't even on the waiting list yet. There's just oh it's just God. wild. So congratulations to you for that. Um, but well, thank you. COVID totally related, fortuitous, but hey, whatever it takes. But yeah. COVID related, um, I'm suffering the same as Zali. Uh, in person event, no. So um, I'm doing as what's new. I'm doing marketing analytics live online, which is live mm -hmm. interviews with a variety of people. This last one we did was Gary Angel. The next one will be um, Greco. Uh, I've got June Dershowitz coming up, and it is two parts. One part is an hour long interview that's edited down to 30 minutes. And then the second part is at the end of the week, a long conversation with the audience. So marketing oh. analytics live online. Uh, the other thing I'm doing is analytics cohorts. I really miss the lobby bar. I really miss the <laughs> chat between sessions. I miss the, the fact that you run into the same people over and over like four times a year and you form these amazing bonds yeah. And we, we don't have that. So this is small grouping. It is uh, twice a month for six months for nice. the same people to meet over and over again in a small group. Just how are you doing? What's happening with your management? What's happening with the people you're managing? All of that stuff. Very cool, Jim. Yeah, I think I saw that. But the, your, the interviews uh, sessions sound great, too. So I'll have to. Are those available to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> they are. They the registration is free. You just have to give right. up your email address. <laughs> I promise Sounds not good. to give it to Facebook. Yeah. So you are on momentarily. Are you ready, Jim? It's your big moment. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. So this is going to be very interesting. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. So take it away, Mr. Stern. Thank you very much. This is um, well. First of all, I have to preface the words of Robert Heinlein. A poet who reads his verse in public may have other nasty habits. This one's called Insight. <clears throat> it's not having the answer. It's dreaming up the question. It's pivoting like a dancer and then testing with regression. It's not about the facts. It's making the connection to that which then attracts you to create a new projection. It's not about the figures, it's about the correlation. And big data just gets bigger with more data integration. It's not the data warehouse, it's the cross association. It's not the beans that count, but considering station. It's asking why and asking how and looking for the info that will open doors and disavow the hip shooting from the hippo. Big data isn't magic, big data is not divine, Big data becomes tragic when art is left behind. Now, the human head contains much more than 100 billion neurons. There are thoughts and schemes and stuff that dreams are built of and are built on. Human beings can look at a cloud and see a face resolving and fantasize how that relates to the problem they're solving. That moment of clarity that's sadly a rarity, that flash of brilliance, a gem, that stroke of genius, that feeling of keenness that emanates from the brainstem, that eye-opening instant of the revelation's existence, that light bulb of new inspiration, that glowing epiphany you recognize instantly, that condensing bright cogitation. When enough information causes recalibration and the mind has shifted perspective, you are now gleaning meaning, and the thoughts superseding are those of the data detective. Feed your head, the Dormouse said. Don't die from dried up facts. Imagination speeds creation, and for that, you must relax. Let your brain recuperate. Give it room to breathe. Let the sweat of your brow evaporate. Stop the grinding of your teeth. Go for a walk. Have a beer, go
go swimming in the ocean, fight a fear, indulge desire, wallow in emotion. As one grows older, Einstein said, one sees the great futility of imposing your will on the chaos with brute force and hostility. But if you can be patient, there may come that moment when your mind is on vacation and the answer bows and says, here I am. Thank you. So Fred's gone away and I still have the stage. All right, I'll do another one. This one is a plea for the word data or data or data or whatever you want to call it. It's about using data as a plural. It's called data. This one's called data singularity. All dictionaries show what the dictionary, and I'm muted again. Now I'm unmuted. Okay, <laughs> I'll start over. All dictionaries show what all dictionary know. Data are data the whole day wrong, and to say that it is, is linguistically wrong. To give the datum its true respect, datums is prodigiously incorrect. That data is plural is demonstrably true, but these data are, just won't do. It all starts with a bit, which is dark or it's lit, and the zeros are the zeros. Eight of them tethered, strung out together, compel the typesetter to say it's a letter. Eight threaded bytes bring to light nouns and verbs and other words. Between the word and the idea conferred lives a citation of information you can transmit that's more than a bit. It's less than an ocean or a single emotion. It's smaller, say scholars, than a drop in the ocean. But if you combine a datum or two, you end up with data upon which you can chew. It's not a word we use as a verb. We mine it, we dig it, enshrine it, and pivot. Data are data the whole day long, and to say that it is is dialectically wrong. However, I propose to oppose this linguistic logistic and suggest that our best is to contradict it. I hereby plea that we all agree to treat the word data singularly. I'm always astonished when people admonish to show disrespect when they try to correct. For data is good. Data is great. Data is our livelihood. Data is intriguing. Data is revealing. Data longs to be understood. Data is use useful. It is truthful. Data we query and drill. Please don't disdain us. That won't refrain us from using data any way we will. And I, I plea that we all agree to use the word data singularly. And if you're unable to abide by this label and can't change your network neural, we vow not to scoff or <clears throat> impolitely cough when you insist on using it as plural. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. It was my little bit of rhyming. I do have an hour and a half of additional rhymes, but I regret that I see the hook coming in from the side and they're gonna- No, you have more time. <laughs> we have how, more time. How much time do I have? Another eight minutes at least, I think. Eight minutes, oh, well then. I will right? I will share one that um, you can put on YouTube. You have four minutes, four minutes. Oh. Well, in that case, I'd better... Oh, seven minutes. Yeah. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just rush right through this. Ready? This one, this one's good. Hold on to your seats. You can find this one on YouTube with accompaniment sung by somebody who actually can sing. I am the very model of a modern data analyst. If insights you are needing, I can whip you up a priceless list. I know the hits and click views, and I slice them categorical, creating many dashboards that display in metaphoricals. I'm very well acquainted to with algorithms, elegant, and how to keep your message in your media most relevant. About big data theory, I'm sick of all the kangaroos who fill your head with promises, of which I must you disabuse. I'm very good at integrating differential data streams. I cluster Hadoop nodes and can create ginormous bit machines. In short, when you need insights, coefficients that can coexist, I am the very model of a modern data analyst. 
for monetizing eyeballs. I can fast and vary conversion rates with multivariate tests and such. I can design for responsive code mobile and for website guests and find the perfect headline for semantic and linguistic tests. Predictive analytics, I'm an expert data scientist. I break down data science with a cookie that can long persist. I've been around since Solon to prove to you that I'm mature. I don't call it a do I will always call it omniture. In behavior targeting with flawless execution, I've wowed peers with feats of multi-channel attribution. In short, I have an affliction not helped by a psychoanalyst. I am the very model of a modern data analyst. To prove that my hypothesis is not random coincidence, I run my test I read statistical significance. When at a cocktail, I can crush a conversation by pointing out the difference twixt conversion, causation, <laughs> concurrent causation. I surely can talk the paint off walls until my friends are vomiting by a quantum maker and with marketing mixed modeling. And to get knowledge colleagues, surely all covet. Join me in May, live streaming the marketing analytics. And when you take on board what you've learned from all our panelists, you'll be the very model of a modern data analyst. <sighs> Thank you. Am I live? Oh my God, Jim. Gilbert and Sullivan and data analytics, it's like the perfect marriage. Holy crap. All right. So is there actually a YouTube version of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. From um, uh, about six years ago. Wow. I wow. Got, went to a local, local city. Uh, there was a Pirates of Penzance performance, and I got the hero into the recording studio and put that to song. Oh my so, God. All right. I know what I'm doing as soon as I'm finished with my host duties. There you go. <laughs> so are you, do you, you're not reading these, right? Do you have them memorized? Oh no, I absolutely am reading these. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then your use of the teleprompter is great because you fooled me. <laughs> Thank you. You know, the, the, the trick is getting rid of the ribbon in Microsoft Word and then putting it right up under and using the scroll bar. And sure, <laughs> it works. That's awesome. Boy, you, you have a life in politics. found so. in the Devil's Data Dictionary. Oh, you know, I'm, these are things around for a while. And yes, a poet who reads his work public may have nasty habits. Jim, that was so cool. So, so, I, I, this has got, you've got to be one of the few, if, if not the only data analyst who's writing poetry about data analytics. <laughs> when did you start? You know, there is this creative thing that comes out in me every now and then. I did another one uh, on, also on you, uh, you remember Don McLean's American Pie? I so do I'll take off on that called The Day Our Privacy Died. <laughs> <laughs> and I found somebody who sounded like Don McLean to, to do the recording. So that's YouTubeable. Um, and then the Devil's Data Dictionary was a, I just needed to, to do something creative and out came this book. So. So seriously, how, on your, on your LinkedIn, is there, is there a link to the YouTubes or how do you, how do you yeah. get to go to, go you mean do you use the search algorithm on YouTube? <laughs> wow! <It's for> me. <laughs> oh my God! So Fred, you have now been in this chair for hours. You must be exhausted. <laughs> I'm, I, frankly, I am. I'm a little stressed, but I'm having so much fun. I just keep laughing at 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 the stupidity that I come up with. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I, I don't have too much longer, energy. so I don't know. I think uh, Matt Gershoff takes over after me, so he's ah. he's an even funnier guy than I am. <laughs> well, then you will well and truly be Matt Gershoff. Yes, exactly, exactly. So I'll tell you, you know, th this whole virtual Super Week thing is working pretty damn well, but... Um, Man, I really should have brought a whiskey bottle or something along with me because that that's what's missing. So do you have anything there, Jim? Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. That's, that's for Matt Gershoff. I picked that up yesterday. That is his his wife, Heather, distillery in Austin. Millen wow. and Green. And I it came to Santa Barbara, so I ran out and got it. So, uh, you know, I'm not feeling any better, Jim. I don't have a keychain. I don't have whiskey. It's like, I've got, I've got my water bottle. Thank God. I, thank God I can rely on myself. 
<laughs> okay, so I think we are um, going to be wrapping up very shortly, and I think it's uh, Super Week Jamaica, a remembrance of times Ooh. down down there. So, Jim, thank you so much. This was a blast to have you here and to listen to your analytics poetry. Just really cool. Thank you. It has been tremendous fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> So what's this called? Marumba. Marumba. It's an African base. Play?
So what's this called? Marumba. Marumba. It's an African bass. Play. Once again, we are live from Super Week. I'm in Milwaukee. Uh, Jeff Sauer, one of my GA heroes from long ago, is in Florida. And Charles, I have no idea where you're at. Seattle or? Yep. Seattle. Okay, cool. So I did have an idea of where you're at. (laughs) Um, So seriously, right now we're going to have two of my GA heroes. Um, I took the time when I really learned Google Analytics was when I took Jeff Sauer's course. And he was filming it live in in, um, in Buenos Aires. And he would like film it one day and I would take the class the next day. And then sometime after that, I took one of the early CXL courses on uh, analytics with Charles and learned a shitload of stuff there, stuff that I still use now. So it's my pleasure to have Jeff Sauer here and Charles Farina. So dudes, what are you guys going to be talking about? That's a great question. I think that Charles and I are going to alternate back and forth with thoughts about, we'll talk about GA4 for sure, but I think more than anything, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about um, prognosticating as to where we think things are going as much as possible. Let's see if Charles yeah. wants to do that. Talk about privacy. We can talk about all the super weeks we've been to, how I owe everything to Jeff because he got me to my first super week. <laughs> and of course, some Google Analytics probably. Yeah. So I'll tell you about the first time that I met Charles and then we'll talk about our lives and then we'll see how long that goes. So Charles and I, it was in the basin of a place in San Francisco. I had, I decided that I was moving to San Francisco and I was there like for a weekend or something like that. 
And Caleb's like, come to this basement of this bar on Market Street. And I, and I couldn't even figure out where the place was. It was one of those places that was unmarked. And sure enough, I go there and I'm like, hey, man, how's it going? And I just read a blog post by Charles. And so I was like, hey, you know, there you go. Um, I, I, what did I say? Hey, Charles, like, I read your blog post. Are you going to Super Week or something like that? Or, or are you, you know, you should go to Super Week. I think that you'd be have something to say. And Charles is like, Caleb, is that cool? Caleb's like, yeah. <laughs> and so the next time I saw Charles, I think it was actually at breakfast the next day, but like, and then we were pretty hungover. But then it was like, what, six months, eight months later in, in Super Week? That's how I recall it, at least. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You uh, asked Caleb on the spot for me, got permission, and I got to go and try to make it just to every Super Week since. Yeah, and then, and then this is the cool thing about Charles is that any time that Zoli invites me to a Super Week, I actually get a direct message from Charles on Twitter the second that Zoli's email hits the thing, he's like, are you going to this? <laughs> like, are you going to Jamaica? And I was like, I just, I just got the email like two minutes ago. And you're like, I'm going, so you should go. It'd be more fun if you go. <laughs> At least that's how I interpret the way that you talk. You sound nothing like that in real, in real life, but that's how your, your persona is when we're, we're talking. So that's how yeah. we got to, that's how we got to Jamaica. And then I, and then the, the India one, I was like, there's no way I'm doing this. And Charles is like, well, I'm going, I don't want to be there alone. So we ended up going to that one too and having a good time. So I think that it's me, um, Zoli, Ari, and Charles, I think might be the only ones who have gone to every super week, every continental super week we've had, but I could be wrong. I'm, Did I'm Yehoshua go reading. to all of them? I think he was at all of them, right? Yehoshua, yeah. I don't think he went to the one in, in Israel or in, in India. Mm, might be, yeah. Kind of an exclusive crew. Yeah. But I, not that I want to only talk about our history, but this, this does have meaning. And that is that in, in meeting with and talking to Charles this whole time, I, I realized that I thought that I knew something about these platforms and what was going on. And then I asked Charles something and he knows with confidence. And so you can tell the difference between somebody who's just like speculating or, or thinking that they know what they're talking about. And then somebody who actually does know what's going on and not just that like a I think this is happening but at an intimate level and that's been really that's been a budding relationship that I've had ever since um ever since we've met at the, that first time or ever since we started to go to super week is just to see that you know what's in the know and I think that's something that only happens when you're involved with the enterprise accounts and and you're involved with all the trainings and all the message boards and everything like that so um this this love fest for Charles is over now but uh, it is it is really cool, and that that's a super weak thing. I didn't, I wouldn't have known that we wouldn't have had a relationship. We wouldn't have done like four webinars together now and talked and and um, had all these things happening if it weren't for that fateful meeting. Yeah, I think Fred, you're about to sign off now, right? So we'll see you later. Adios, Fred. He can he can stay. I think he's on he's off the stream, but I did want to. Since I, I'll, I'll, since we don't really have a, a topic per se, I it is interesting though to think about all this stuff and, and what's happening. So, how did you first get into GA and get so? How did you get so much knowledge so quick? Because you seemed like this little kid out of college when I first met you, and you like and you pretty much knew more than me. Yeah. So I think the story of how I fell in love with analytics and Google Analytics is especially relevant, even with everything going on now. So. I started off about 10 years ago. Um, I had uh, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life in college. So I switched from accounting to a math major and eventually uh, ended up in marketing. And I really got all my experience in my internships. And through my internships that I had, uh, largely unpaid, uh, I actually got to dabble in all the different areas, SEO, SEM, and one of the things that I fell in love with was the analytics part. And um, I had the responsibility to kind of take ownership of the implementation. And in doing that, I think like any college student does, you kind of think you're an expert. And I thought I was pretty great at what I was doing. So I actually decided that in Wyoming, where I was going to school, there was no opportunities for me. So I had to find somewhere else to go in the US. And I ended up finding Caleb's conference at the time. He had this conference, I think, called Gage. 
Um, mm -hmm. And at that time, it was actually when Cardinal Path came together. They didn't exist yet. And if you have a memory of Google Analytics, this was around the time multi-channel funnels and real-time was released. So it was kind of when uh, Universal started to come out and all those big refreshes happened. But anyways, I went to this conference and within 10 minutes of being there, I learned I knew nothing about Google Analytics. In fact, everything I had done, I had broken everything. I had added UTMs all over my own website. So broken the attribution. I had broken all the cross domain tracking, pretty much anything you shouldn't have done, I, I did. But it was at that moment, I had this realization that every day I felt like there was something new to learn or some something new that was just gonna be unique that I could apply it to. And that's held true even today. Like I think the current events, Jeff, like we have all these changes with cookies and privacy. I think the next big thing is GA is still largely a, a system that's built off of unconsented data. It's just tracked by default. I think very quickly we'll all have this GDPR kind of model where there'll have to be some sort of opt-in and we'll have more modeling uh, than we ever did before, kind of like happens in Google Ads and Facebook. And it's, it's just brought through that same passion that I had and that realization at that conference where every day there's something new and something different. And that's why I love GA. So that's yeah. my, my quick background. Love it. And that's, that's a good lesson for anybody who's listening. If, if, they, if anybody's thinking about a career here, that timeline's pretty, it, it, it's not a long timeline from you. Like Universal Analytics came out, I think it was 2012 because I wrote, I blogged about it. And it was just announced. It wasn't even live yet. So 2012, you're, you know, and, and if you're interning at that time or going to see things, you were, I, you knew everything within a year or two of that, which is crazy. So the good lesson here is one, we think that we know everything. We don't, but then <laughs> every once in a while, if you stick with it long enough and you dig deep enough into it and you have a chip on your shoulder and you want to prove it wrong, it doesn't take too long to actually know more than most and to know enough and be confident and, and to follow along with what's going on. It's not like we're talking about a 15 year decorated career to get to that point. And I'm not trying to undermine what you've achieved, Charles, because you've achieved quite a bit. I mean, I'm very impressed every time we, I check in with your new titles, but more than anything, it's just for anybody else who's starting, if you have that passion and, and, and you get tasked with and delegated the responsibility of analytics, which is often for most organizations, a leftover function, it's very rarely a primary function unless you're a very analytics driven company, um, you know, analytics forward. It, it's cool to see what you can do, but then, but then you have to seize that opportunity at the same time. You can't just, you can't just be a, a big fish in a small pond and know more about GA than somebody else who has a site or think that, you know, have this hubris, you need to pollinate ideas. And that's a soft sell again for, for why something like super week is so important because it, it strengthens everything. Like I, I actually learned way more from super week, just from the, the hallway conversations and the presentations than I, than I, than you ever could in an account, you need to spread those ideas to other people or yep. share them with other people. Exactly. And it's, I mean, just from the career opportunities, there's just so much out there right now. Um, and regardless of everything that's happening, some of the ways, you know, some of these systems work are going to transform, but the principles are all the same. And like, it's cool. Uh, another like topic of discussion is just like the themes of Super Week and how those have changed over the years. And we saw that the last few years, we started talking about privacy in ways we've mm -hmm. never talked before. You can even see some of the conversations with like ads, uh, like advertising specific to topics are starting to pop up. We've got everything with data science. And you just look at the opportunities that are out there for people in the space. And it's still, I think, in huge demand. Like. There's demand for people that specialize or have broad experience in pretty much everything that touches um, what we do. And again, yeah. that's my excitement because it's it's just something new every day. I share that same excitement as you though, because I was at first I, I didn't really like the idea of app plus web. I thought it was like it was like divide and conquer, but make both sides worse. <laughs> um, meaning that you're like it's not the best. It's not the best version of the web for sure. Maybe it's really great for mobile, but I just felt like it was just trying to do too much. Um, still have still have some lingering sentiment about that, but then you know, it's not this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not like Google's just like, hey, we need to do this. There's also all these environmental factors that go into why we had to do this, why it had to be now, why they had to push out something that was not 
Um, maybe it was a beta that they call the alpha, or not the alpha, but the, uh, the, the ready for prime time version of GA. And that is these privacy concerns like you talk about. And so it's really, it, it's forced me to think about things differently. Um, I'm, I'm at the point where I'm, I'm old enough to be set in my ways. And so I don't want somebody to have to change something. I, but at the same time, it's a wake up call. It woke me up quite a bit to realize how, how complacent I had become in the way that I was looking at things, how, how I really needed that, that spark and that innovation and that, that new way of looking at things. And now it's like, you can't unsee it. Once you start thinking that way, you start thinking about, um, I don't know if you saw the, the news. I'm sure you did because this is what you do, but the, the Google, the cookie replacement for Google ads and how it's 95% as effective or more than, than doing a cookie pool from third party cookies. It's like, okay, well, you know, we could have just said, Hey, let's give up. Let, you know, they're going to block cookies. It's over. Or you can, for, it can, you know, the platforms and eventually the service providers can innovate and, and do things around it where you get the same result, but you don't have to violate somebody's privacy. You don't have to be creepy, you know? So those are the, that's really exciting to me is that um, this, this, it, it, I, I look at it as this, this sparked the new wave of innovation, meaning a new way of um, an open platform um, of first party data with GA. So you actually have data that you can export much easier. Um, you can integrate it better with, with different items. It's not, it's not nearly as heavy or heavyweight as it used to be, but for the better, because it can spark new innovation and derivative products off of it that I hadn't seen actually since Universal came out. Basically, mm -hmm. Universal GA came out and broke every plugin that was working with the old GA. Um, this happened in, in you know the early 2010s. And then people, I, like not very many apps were really built off of GA for quite some time because of that. Like the Google Analytics app gallery, it's pretty much broken. Um, maybe unless they fixed it recently, you know, like all these different other ways of sharing segments and stuff like that, those are all broken. But I think what it allows us to do is this is this new platform is going to spark the new wave of innovation because it's at the beginning of something big. Yeah. And I think, I think people don't give Google enough credit. Like did, until you get into the weeds of how Google Analytics really works and you, you have the realization that, you know, it's on like over half of the internet the amount that Google has like put in on the back end is just insane. And it's, and I, I say this every time I talk about GA4, like it truly is astounding that GA still works today and it's 15 years old and you can use the original tracking code that urchin.js and it still successfully processes data today. And it's, it's amazing. But because of that, it's brought its own challenges, right? And Many of us who have worked in the platform, you know, have come to the realization that it doesn't work well with some of the challenges in today on the universal side. So data deletion is a huge uh, challenge in universal. Like if you capture any PII, you end up having to delete all of like your pages or all of your events. Um, and many people even on enterprise have wanted fresher BigQuery data and, and just faster uh, data in the platform. And kind of what's a challenge is just balancing that, right? How, how long it's been around with kind of the needs we have today. So what I'm really excited about GA4 and this new model they have is just, you can see the investment and the foundation and I think the potential. So already like the data deletion tool can be laser focused. BigQuery, the streaming BigQuery data is within seconds. It's even faster than anything we have in GA360 in the paid version. And um, Google shared a few different times in some of their marketing emails that they're working on uh, new components with the consent mode. So with these consent frameworks, when we start having the, the absence of, of consented data, they're gonna start introducing scaled and models and all sorts of other things to, again, just tackle the challenges that we're gonna have as kind of marketers in the future. So I think the, the biggest challenge and what I would just like to talk about of where like App Plus Web and GA4 is today is it's still not ready to replace Universal, but if you just focus on the foundation and where and what we could have very, very soon, I think that's, that's where I get really excited uh, about that potential. Yeah, there's so much potential out there and you're right. I mean, data modeling and, and actually one thing I was, I wanted to ask you about since, since I think you know more about me than this on this is it's a lot more lightweight, like GA4, like the amount of data that is collected 
is significantly less, right? I would say at least it probably half as, as much space that is, it is consumed with a hit. Um, and they have a lot less redundant and useless information that they collect. You know, like, like they don't collect nearly as much worthless data that clogs up the internet as they used to. Was that accurate? I think yes and no. For, for me, the bigger thing is, is it was just designed more efficiently. It was designed yeah. with today and the future needs. So as an example, we all, or many of us know, Google Analytics has always had this limit where you, you're not supposed to collect more than 10 million hits per month. And, and you may or may not know, even the enterprise version has some arbitrary limits. Now with GA4, right now, at least today, there is no limit. If you wanna send 30 billion uh, events in the free version, it's built to handle that. So from my sense, it's kind of yes and no, like absolutely, it's designed to be more efficient. And right now it seems to be, it's built to collect less, but at the same time, it's open. Like we can start handling use cases GA has never been great at. So mm -hmm. my favorite one to pick on is uh, for large clients that have high volumes of video data. So streaming video or video on demand, those are massive amounts of, of hit volumes and Universal wasn't really built to handle that. But GA4 can, for the first time, I think, truly handle like first party kind of video use cases that was just never there before. And publishers as well uh, is like another, another obvious benefit. Um, so for me, it's kind of yes and no. Uh, but again, if you just focus on, on the- on, When you, on say, the, when you say built to handle it though, what do you mean? Is it the data architecture? Is it the actual database that, that's, that it's running on? Like what, what is built to handle it? Is it, is it that it stores less data? Is it, the, is it the retrieval? Is it the machines that it's on? What's, what, what, what makes it so much more efficient? Everything's more efficient. Um, so an example is like just that BigQuery stream. So GA360, you get your daily tables and you get your 10 to 15 minute streaming inserts. You can't get data faster in a BigQuery uh, through the official kind of GA360 pipelines without building something yourself. Hmm. Um, but in the way they designed it. And I have a feeling that it largely comes down to the event-based data model. It's just more efficient because everything's an event and we don't have different hit types and all of that. Um, and because of that, it can just end up being extremely faster. On the other side, I think, um, you know, GA, there's a lot of features that were in there like filters and views. And in GA4, we don't have a lot of that that's happening or it's been built differently. So yeah. a lot of our filters is actually kind of built into event editing and that just makes it a, a lot more efficient for this. So, so, so to summarize, it's, it's basically saying if you, well, yeah, cause a view and a filter, that's, that's a permutation and that's towards infinity. So if you have, a, if you have the three views that we recommend a test view, a, a reporting view and an unfiltered view, that's three X the data even if, even if the, the hit itself isn't as big, then you have different hit types, which have different data storage mechanisms and you're sending events differently. So you're, you're actually much more inefficient. And so I would say that on a standard install that I would have recommended at any point in time for Universal with the three, the three views, that's the official Google stance that we all adopted, plus any type of event tracking, plus any type of e-commerce, we're talking about at least eight times the data being stored for a a property on average, and then you 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 add that to fifty three point four percent of the internet, which I believe that number that is the number. Now we're talking about massively lim eliminating data, so they're more efficient because they just don't they don't yeah. allow you to to permutate nearly as much, which which means there's a lot less on the books for them, and less on the books for them is good because they're a giant target for privacy, and less on the books for you for all of us is good. However, it's like, okay, well, they're going to introduce views, right? That was the news that Fred shared with me that, that there was on a live stream and they're talking about introducing views. So are we going to, you know, is that coming back? Is it one of these things where they just had a once in a lifetime chance to start over and they're just going to keep on adding crap in there? Or do you think they're going to hold the line and say, we're, st we're going to stay efficient, efficient first? Uh, I mean, the way I, I kind of view it is the, the focus has been on building the foundation and the core. And then over time, we're going to see all of the other things that we really need from a use case perspective. So there's going to there's gonna have to be a lot of features around everything you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. But I just kind of go back, like I'm not a data scientist and like Simo or Christina or Mark Edmondson, like 
they could probably get into the the way data is stored and relational and why it's more efficient. It's just, for me, it's, it's pretty easy if I just think of it. The way it was designed, it's carrying that 15 years of technical debt. And to your point now, they've just started over and they, they've built everything to be way more efficient from the very beginning. And because of that, now we're having some of these advantages that we've never had before. And what I like about it is I think where it's at is it's a place where some of the stuff I don't think can go away. Like Google, if you go into GA4 today and you set up BigQuery, it'll say you're streaming data within seconds. I don't think that's I don't think that can go away at this point. So all the new features that happen, I think that foundation will stay. And that's just why I'm so excited about the foundation that's here. Um, it's still early. And I think Google has been, been pretty clear that, you know, if Universal has been your primary place where you do analysis, not time to, to move over to GA4 as primary. Um, but we'll, we'll definitely have more conversations this year because um, we've seen in the release notes, Google has been releasing things like every other week yeah, it's amazing. into this product. Yeah. It's, and Charles is an awesome source for that. Everybody, his Twitter account is, is where I get a lot of information and, and you see all these things that are implemented. Like, like this in the last week, Charles tipped my hat to a few things that I was waiting for. Um, the sources of traffic in data studio and also, um, the demo account, or maybe somebody else tipped my hat to that. But anyway, there, there's, there's enough news that every week something changes. That's pretty major. I was going to say, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say the biggest things that I'm waiting for, for when I'm going to start pushing the gas on GA4 more, we need an internal referral exclusion list. So that's high priority on my list. We need uh, more attribution. So right now in GA4, the foundation's there. So one of the exciting things is for the first time ever, you can actually change the default attribution model for the entire platform. Um, but right now it's only really just different last click options. So we need the flexible attribution and the attribution modeling tool. And then I think some of those view level components or, or user like granular user permissions are like the third thing. Like once we get those three things in there, yeah. uh, I, I think we start to have kind of a pretty solid foundation in place to be able to, to rely on it for most of our work. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just, the well, last thing I was thinking is Google's not really trying to monetize this at this point, which is sort of interesting. You know, um, what does this mean for the enterprise? I know you work a lot with enterprises. I'm sure that you have some non-disclosure stuff that you can't really share, but is this something where they're just like, we don't care about trying to pay charge for it anymore. We just want you all to be efficient or is, or is that just sort of like a, a dream that, that we're going to get unbridled GA after? In uh, so Google, I think, has already announced that an enterprise version is coming. And it's, from my perspective, they still very much care about enterprise. They care about all clients using it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the GA4 product just follows every other Google product they release. They like to throw things out very quickly, uh, even before you might say it should be thrown out. But it's just the way they work, right? They throw it out, they get it out quickly, and then from there, they adopt and innovate. Um, and that's what we're seeing now. The, the foundations here... Uh, and my thought is, you know, over the next year, two years, we're going to start seeing tons of enterprise features, other features, even for the standard version. And again, if you just pay, if you just pay attention to those release notes that come, uh, Google's kind of putting everything behind this right Give now. Give me so, an exact date for when I, when you're going to recommend that people switch over. Uh, I can't say. I, I'm waiting for those three features. So I don't. Price is right rules. All right, Google. July one, 2021. Just because that's, that's, that's my goal prediction. <laughs> All right. So I think we're done. That's our time. Excellent. We build robots. Okay. Hey, it's me, Jeff Sauer, and I'm going to do a video about working out of your spare bedroom. And that's what I've been doing for quite some time. So can we see my screen? Can you guys just give me a thumbs up that you can see it? Um, okay, cool. So here's the interesting thing. I, I, you've probably heard my history before, but I was a nomad for a long time and I have been working out of a spare bedroom for, for quite a bit of time. And, and right now I'm, I'm in a, place where I'm working out of a spare bedroom. So there you go. I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting to think that. Um, and so what I'm showing you right now is you can see me on this webcam right here, 
But if you go over to here, this is my good camera that I use to produce videos. Now, this camera is a quite a different setup than, than my webcam. Um, we'll pull the webcam over here, you can see. But this is sort of the setup, that this, the, 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 the scene behind the scene. So um, I just wanna show you what I've put in place in order to create a video where I can have myself look, I, I think this looks okay. Um, how I can record stuff and and what it took to get to this point. And then just give some tips on videos in general, because I think video is becoming a bigger part of everybody's lives. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, I every year I sort of upgrade my studio a little bit, um, whether, you know, and, and I, and I upgrade the, the, the room that I'm in and um, change a little bit of equipment once I realize something's not working very well. So for example, um, I've had this webcam uh, and I don't actually, I'll show you the webcam in my big one. So I've had this webcam right here. It's a Logitech. Actually, it's not focused very well. It's wired. So it's, it's a Logitech uh, 1080p webcam that I've had. And eventually I realized that the image that I have was flat. Like it's very flat. It doesn't separate me from the background all that well. And, and I consider it to be flat. And the reason why was because of the lighting. So so if you don't have very good lighting to sit, to separate you in, in a background and something to light you up and so on, you're just not gonna look, it's not gonna look great. So most people have an overhead light. So here's, I just turned on the overhead light above me and they have like a, you know, a, a incandescent light bulb and that it, it can look okay sometimes, but, but many people just don't look very good when they're on a camera or in a Zoom meeting. Now, because I have a, a digital business and I've had to be on the road so much, I was like, well, that doesn't work. I can't tell people, like people don't care if they're your paying customer. They don't care if you're in a spare bedroom or not. They want, they want you to, to, to look professional. They, you know, if you're doing broadcasting, you can't say I have a bad internet connection. You can't say I didn't have my right equipment. They wanna see the best stuff you have. And so over time I've upgraded. I said, okay, I don't wanna do a webcam. I'll do a webcam if I'm on Zoom in this little small spot. But if I'm doing a on-camera thing or a sales video, I need to upgrade the video. Um, the other thing is, I, I showed you that I changed my light. I don't like I don't like relying on the light above my head, and so I've actually upgraded over the years several different times. At first, I went on to Amazon.com and got a a lighting kit. It was called uh, um, Limo Studio. I got a Limo Studio lighting kit from Amazon. It was like a it's it looked like a so, it's called a softbox, so you're not actually getting the light directly on you. It was less than $100 and I got two of them and they were both sort of pointing at me. And I was under the impression that if I just have enough light on me, then I'm gonna be killing it, right? That I'm gonna be doing so great with lighting. And, and after consuming a ton of tutorials and, and really just being dense like I, I, like I often am, I realized that I was actually giving myself too much light. So a lot of times, and, and I'll show you my YouTube channel, just so you can see my evolution a little bit. And I, and I will warn you that I'm not, I'm still not perfect at this. It, 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 it comes and goes, like I get better time, time and time again. But if you go to, when I first started doing the lighting and I had a, and I thought that I had a pretty high end camera, but I, it wasn't that great. But this is how my lighting setup used to be. I put a green screen behind me. Oh, these stupid ads on my account. Even I have to see my own ads. So, so this is how I was set up. I had too much light on my face. And that can even be the case when you do this. When you do this light, it's like I had too much light. And so there's a difference between having light on you and having too much light. And so now, instead of having these two bright lights with no temperature settings, no adjustments at all, both pointing at me at the same angle, it was like this. And I was in a spare bedroom, so it was just pointing on myself. What I learned was I had too much light just too much and it was washing myself out and the camera settings were wrong. And so now what I have is I have a single light box right here and it's hard, to, oh yeah, there we go. This is like a, it's, it's like on a stand, you can see down there. Sorry, I didn't clean up very well. Um, this is a spare bedroom as you can see, um, but it's on a stand. I had to upgrade the quality of the stand too, but basically I only have it coming at me from one angle. And what that does is it creates a really cool effect. You have it coming at you from 45 degrees and it, and it unlights this side of your face and it creates that separation we're talking about and it creates a nice jawline for you. So actually this isn't a bad example because probably had lost some weight at that point, 
But when you do it this way, it creates a jawline and it gets rid of most of the double chin. I haven't been able to fully get rid of it. The only way to do that is to, is to go on a diet. Um, but uh, yeah, it gets rid of it. It makes you look so much better. So there's a difference in my videos and the quality that's come up because I figured out the lighting and it came down to one box from a 45 degree angle. Now that didn't solve everything though. Um, one of the things about being in a spare bedroom is that it, it the walls, like, you know, I, I've heard people give the advice is like, just find a window and a white wall and then you can create awesome videos. Well, if you look at this, here's a white wall and it's too dark out to do a window, but I, I don't have, this, this is, this is a regular wall. And so there's this like behind me, you can tell that I'm in a weird room, right? Like it's just like a nondescript bedroom. Um, now I didn't, I don't have a budget or I'm, I'm renting somewhere right now. So I don't have the ability to, to like, if they don't have a bookcase, how do I do a bookcase? And even if you have a bookcase, um, it has to have something interesting in it, right? Most people, when they're recording, especially in a pandemic world or in a lockdown world, we're using a bedroom where people are like walking behind us or we're, do, we're using a room that, that might be in the middle of the house. And so we, we don't, most houses aren't designed to have that, that functionality. And so what I did is I, I just, I, I carry around this one light with me, which folds up pretty decently. And then I have these LED strip lights. So I just turned on the LED strip light. And what that is, is this is um, $14 on amazon.com. And it's basically got this little con controller. Oops, I just unplugged it. This is, uh, this is how I create the light effect. So here it is. And as you can see here, it gives different, I have a button where I can change the lights and it has an app. So I can change what lights I have and what color I have. And so what I'll do is I'll batch produce videos at the same time. And all that I do is change my shirt. So I'll do like a purple video. I'm just gonna put this in the background because it, it reflects off the wall a little bit. So I'll do a purple video with this shirt. And then I actually, and many times I'll have like a little, I'll have all these other shirts in the closet and I'll take this off and I'll record a different one. And it will look like I recorded all these things on different days, but I might record 10, 15 videos in a single day and then just have them be released over the course of several months. And so that's one of the, that's one of the, the things that I found is that just the simple LED light and a single key light on your face at a 45 degree angle will make you look so much better. Um, and, and you can do it for under hundred dollars that setup. Um, mine is more than hundred dollars now, but that's because I upgraded piece by piece over time. So you can use the webcam on your laptop, 45 degree angle for the light coming in at you and then um, LEDs in the background and you will have a great lighting setup that will make you look good. It'll create a jawline for you and you will look like the most professional person on your Zoom call. So that, that's, like the, that's like the nutshell of how I've upgraded. So you can see uh, everything on here was green screen. I was sometimes cast for the friendly ghost. Sometimes I look better, but it was very inconsistent. And I was using a lens that sort of, it was not very forgiving. If I moved a little bit, I'd be off camera. Um, this one, these ones, these ones are getting a little bit better, but I also had some lighting issues. As you can see, like I had, I had like, like glossy looking skin because I didn't really know actually what my settings were. And now I've gotten to the point where I think I have the right medium between the two. This one's a little bit light. Um, and, and actually I've stopped producing a lot on, on YouTube lately um, for, for actually, I guess I do, I do post some stuff on the YouTube. Um, it's, it's not perfect by any means, but it's gotten to be better and better over time. And the whole premise and the whole thing I'm, I'm telling you about is, um, is just really this. It's the, the 45 degree angle for your key light um, preferably not at full blast. You want to have some kind of control over how light you make it. Um, and then you, you want to have something in your background to separate you. And, and what I'll say about this is that you don't want to have too much light. I was under the impression that you needed a lot of light to make good looking videos. Light is one of those things where you want to control light and turn it all off. And then you only want to add light. So you never want to make light something that you that you start with and then you subtract, you add light as it's justified. And so at the, what I'm looking at right now, I feel like I look pretty well lit right now. And it's, and it's two pieces of equipment that you could purchase and put into your spare bedroom or your office, whatever it is. And it's less than a hundred dollars. And so that's the main premise of what I wanted to, to get out to you and share with you. I think I have a few more minutes though to talk. And so what I wanted to, to say, or when I, when I, when I did a few more minutes is, um, 
you don't really need to spend a lot of money on equipment, but if you want to, and I, and I realize that my microphone has been far away, you can spend a lot of money on equipment. And so over time, you might want to upgrade it, but I would start with saying, okay, I want to, I want to accomplish this. I want to look good. I want the, the, the better looking jawline and I want a, a, a background that looks good. I'm going to put a hundred bucks into it. And then if you get some kind of success with your, with your videos and you start liking it, you maybe start putting some stuff on YouTube. You start really trying harder or seeing some, some wins and some gains. You put it on your LinkedIn, however you want to distribute these things, then try adding in a, a better microphone. Um, um, for the setup for the YouTube videos, at first I started with just a lavalier microphone, uh, you can, or a lapel microphone that you can clip onto your shirt. You can get those for under $20 on Amazon and they're amazing. Okay. Then after that, you can go to, um, instead of recording on a webcam, you might want to start recording on a, on a 4k camera, which I have right over here. And that's what I was showing you earlier. You can do the 4k, um, and you can broadcast in 4k. I have this little piece of equipment over here called a cam link 4k. And this thing, I don't have it plugged in right now because it stopped working, but this will actually allow you to plug your SLR into an HDMI, and then you can stream it live to the internet. So you can, you can broadcast using a nice camera as a 4K camera, which is, I think is pretty cool. And so that's, that's the type of stuff that you end up being able to do when you, one, have a commitment to, to, to being the best looking person on your Zoom call whenever you can, as far as lighting goes, not, not, uh, not physical attractiveness, because we got the Gershoff family coming up next, and that's, that's unbeatable. But when we talk about, um, in general, just, just looking like you are professional, you can do it for varying price points and varying levels. And hopefully this is a little bit of a lesson for you or, or sort of a breakthrough. Um, and the reason why I decided this topic is because I struggled for this for a long time. I, I really hated all the videos that I did to the point where I would take the camera and throw it and be really upset about it and want to just give up on video altogether. I've quit doing video more times than I, than most people have started doing video content. And the breakthrough that I had was add light, add light sparingly. Don't start with too much light and then take away. It just never works that way. So that's, that's your relationship with the light that you have. And hopefully you found that to be helpful and useful. And I think that is the end of my time. So I'm going to hand it over to everybody's favorite uh, person in the world, Fred and Matt. Jeff, thanks so much. Um, this is the end of my session.